116.2 says, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Dr. J.T.R. Satyasilin, Vice Principal of self Finance Stream of Bishabiba College, has been a great leader and a source of inspiration to all of us. We are grateful to have him here to offer the opening prayer. I request the gathering to rise up for the opening prayer. The prayer will be followed by a prayer song and Tamar Thai Varta. So I request the gathering to kindly remain standing. Let us pray. Loving, gracious Father. We thank you, Lord. We adore you. We praise you for all the blessings that we have received from your mighty hands. Lord, we especially pray for three-day conference very meticulously organized by the Department of Environmental Science. Lord, we pray for all the dignitaries who are on the stage. We especially pray for our Bishop Aya, for his constant support, encouragement, and guidance. Lord, we pray for our chief guests, dignitaries who have arrived today to grace this conference. We commit our principal, vice principal, aided section, as well as the head of the Department of Environmental Science. And we also commit all the faculty members who are responsible for organizing this conference, Lord. The very idea of organizing this conference is to have insight on the sustainability, Lord. You have spoken in the scripture that the Garden of Eden should be maintained or preserved by the first ancestors, Adam and Eve, who were put in the Garden of Eden to maintain the Garden. Lord, you are still teaching us to look forward to maintaining the sustainability. Lord, we continue to pray for the sustainability of environmental surroundings, Lord. We pray for our country, nation, India, to have more light towards the environmental consciousness. Lord, let this conference be the eye-opener for all of us to think more about the environmental consciousness and sustainability to be towards the preservation of all the resources that are available in our country. Lord, continue to bless us and give us the guidance and teaching so that we can safeguard and maintain our country, Lord. Let this conference be the source of enlightening of such discussions and deliberations. Lord, you have come to earth to teach us the harmony and to maintain the fellowship among people so that we can live happily with a proper environmental safetyness. God bless you. We also pray for the entire college community to take a lead towards Green India till 2030, Lord, we are going to have a prosperity in our country. Lord, forgive our sins, all mistakes done by mankind, so that, Lord, we can rethink and reconsider and rebuild our nation. Continue to bless us and guide us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Today, the 21st March, March is observed as World Forest Day. The aim of observing this day is to increase public awareness about the significance and contributions of the forest for sustenance of life on Earth. With this thought, with this thought in mind, let us work towards a sustainable future for conserving the nature. May I invite Professor Ray Alagappa Moses to welcome and thank the gathering. Esteemed Chief Guest, the Vice Chancellor of the Periyar Maniyame Institute of Science and Technology, 
revered bishop the right reverend dr chandrasekharan the chairman and secretary of bishop heba college and the bishop of csi tiruchirappalli tanjavur diocese respected principal dr paul dayabaran our special guest dr gupta from indraprastha university new delhi members of the faculty from the department of zoology the head dr priscilla suresh dr anand gidian the head of the department of botany and uh, the members of the faculty of department of environmental sciences and our vice principal dr jj satyasilan of s of section and uh, loving participants and uh, dear students and dignitaries it gives me great pleasure to welcome the gathering especially a special word of welcome to our chairman and secretary the right reverend dr d chandrasekharan the bishop of the csi trichirappalli tanjavur diocese he has readily accepted our invitation it was a month ago we invited him to be part of this event and he is very much concerned about the environment and the conservation of environment and uh, he readily agreed our invitation and he is now with us in spite of his busy schedule and he is also shouldering the responsibility of uh, the bish moderators commissary of the newly formed 25th diocese of the church of synod the csa synod the e road salem diocese in spite of all his episcopal assignments and the diocesan assignments and of the college and being an administrator and manager of all the diocese and schools and institutions he is with us in gracing this occasion so on behalf of the organizing committee and the sustainable environment economy 2030 and all the department of environmental sciences students and staff i extend a very warm and cordial welcome to our bishop welcome you here <clears throat> we were thinking of uh, the the right guest chief guest who can deliver inaugurate the event and also deliver the inaugural address and uh, we thought of there is one institution in the vicinity of uh, trichirappalli which is about close to trichy uh, located in vallam tanjavur the periyar Uni university periyar maniamma university earlier called and now it is renamed as periyar maniamma institute of science and technology so we thought we can invite the vice chancellor of this university uh, the main reason behind is this is one of the universities in the state of tamil nadu i can say that has earmarked zero carbon and carbon neutral campus way back in 15 years before so i congratulate the initiatives taken by the former vice chancellor of the university and uh, especially the former uh, heads of the civil engineering department and uh, the present dean who is one of our illustrious alumnus dr kumaran who is with us uh, today so uh, we thought this is the right campus to be a model to the rest of the society and that's how we have now with us in our miss our esteemed vice chancellor dr velu swami sir of the periyar maniamma institute of science and technology we welcome you sir it's a great pleasure for me to welcome our illustrious alumnus dr kumaran who has, uh, has come along with dr velu swami sir the vice chancellor so I welcome you dr kumaran and we have a special guest here dr gupta from indraprastha university in new delhi and he is also associated with a lot of uh, new uh, projects intended towards the sustainability so we welcome you sir and i welcome in our midst our uh, respected principal dr paul dayapran sir and our vice principal dr jg r satyasilam welcome you sir both <clears throat> i welcome our uh, dr prasila suresh the head of the department of zoology and associate dean of research and development and dr anand gidian the dean of extension activities and head of department of botany and the members of the faculty from the department of zoology uh, dr jeremia and all the members from the department of environmental sciences dr ravichandran uh, the ug coordinator and the organizing secretary of uh, this event uh, dr udaya banu and dr sugumar the associate organizing secretary and uh, all the members of the faculty so this is a welcome address as well as uh, a note of thanks as well to brief you about the conference 
So uh, this Department of Environmental Sciences was started in the year 1984 with a mission of ensuring environmental sustainability, even at that point of time, when the World Commission on Environment and Development was formed in the United Nations. So the commission was chaired by the Prime Minister of Norway, then Prime Minister of Norway, Gro Harlem Brundtland, and she was the chair of the commission, and she was the one who led the entire commission to define the sustainable development later in 1987. So when the, the department was started in 84, we had a vision that the department should, should strive towards sustainability and to should take care of all the scriptures, the teachings in the scriptures as in the prayer, Dr. J.J.R. Satyasilan has pronounced that the scripture has a lot of uh, you know, like illustrations about sustainability and models of sustainability and everything. So therefore, we thought we can have this ensuring environmental sustainability could be the main mission of this department. And later on till now today, it's about almost 39 years have been completed and we're going to step into the 40th year from the 1st of June of 2023. So as we have tread past this 39 years, we have had very great memories, great teachings and create learnings across the entire state, across India and the globe. So when we thought of this conference, this sustainability, environment and economy. So this sustainable environment and economy is the need of the hour. As I said, the mission was ensuring environmental sustainability and that was the seventh goal of Millennium Declarations, the Millennium Development Goal. So in the MDG, the seventh goal, when it says ensuring environmental sustainability, it had a lot of targets, especially the target being the sanitation, being providing access to water and accelerating a change, which is going to be the theme of the World Water Day of 2023, which is going to be uh, observed tomorrow. So these were all the targets set by the United Nations Environment Program way back in 19, sorry, in 2000 on the 26th of September in New York. So when this was conducted and, uh, you know, like all these targets, especially having 33% of green cover in every campus of every institutions is being the second main target, uh, which has been pronounced in the seventh goal of Millennium Declarations. And they wanted every one of these targets and indicators to be achieved by 2015. But you know, the status was very poor or just about 30% was achieved. And uh, they wanted to have this seventh goal to be like, uh, to be, you know, formed as a detailed, uh, you know, 17 goals as the sustainable development goals. And that's where we now stand here in 2023, almost about eight years past. And even now, you know, like we are not, uh, you know, like meeting about almost 50% of that. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, new innovative ideas in terms of preserving the environment need to be followed and we want all the young minds to follow this. So this is where Bishop Heber College, the Department of Environmental Sciences is being, uh, you know, like accepted by the United Nations Student uh, Sustainable Development Goals Student Program and the program meant for the youth. And that's how we have been associated with that organization. Uh, and. Uh, we have also took part in uh, being the coordinator for one zones, wherein even the Periyar Maniam Institute also, they have participated in that event. So this is how the institution should like proceed with in terms of, you know, like addressing all the sustainable development goals. So that is how we thought we can have this program SDG 2023 need to be a conference, which need to be focused on sustainable environment and economy. One thing every one of us should realize that, remember that it is the modern, the postmodern world. When we say that it is a postmodern world and a modernism and modernity, you know, there is no, you know, like benchmark for a modern society, a pre modern society, and a postmodern society. David Orr, one of the famous authors of the book Ecological Literacy, and transforming the world into the postmodern society tells that, you know, like there is no benchmark for a pre modernity. When we were young in 1970s, we thought that what was there in 1950 was a modern society. And later, when the industrialization came in, it becomes a, a modern society. And then now, with all the electronic, you know, like society in, in, in its implications and everything, we think that there is a societal 
influence on the industries and then everything which could be considered as a postmodern but there is no much no important scale no scale is available for us to realize this so this conference the c2030 aims at addressing all these uh, implications and uh, tries to bring in all the young minds to address all the 17 goals with 169 indicators and 240 uh, sorry 169 targets and uh, 248 indicators so uh, with this note, I would like to conclude and I would like to express my sincere and humble thanks to our revered bishop for accepting our invitation and uh, to be with us. And I thank the vice chancellor of the Periyar Maniam Institute of Science and Technology for gracing the occasion and then he's going to deliver the inaugural address. And my sincere thanks to our uh, respected principal and the bursar of the college, the vice principal, Dr. Jeja Satya Selen, and uh, all the heads and coordinators of the Department of Environmental Sciences. That is, this department is an interdisciplinary department. So therefore we have a, a strong support from the Department of Zoology, Chemistry, Botany, Physics, Computer Science and Mathematics. I, I profoundly thank all the heads of these departments and coordinators of these departments and the members of the faculty, those who are taking classes for us for uh, being part of this event. And I thank the organizing secretary and the joint organizing secretary and all the members of the faculty of department of environmental sciences and the student friends and all the participants of this C2030. So my sincere thanks to you. I hope that you're going to have a very pleasant three day event, which will enlighten us with a lot of new insights in addressing all these 17 goals, 169 targets and 248 indicators. I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It is always a pleasure to hear your words of wisdom and encouragement. We appreciate your presence here today. The logo of the conference symbolizes magnifying the unnoticed areas where sustainable living, environment and economy plays a major role in transformation. Nurturing a plant with water is as nurturing young minds with knowledge. Watering the plant is a tradition followed by the Department of Environmental Sciences in order to inculcate an attitudinal change among people towards sustenance of life. I request the delegates on the dais to inaugurate the conference by watering the plant. If there is magic on this planet, it is contained in water. For in the true nature of things, if we rightly consider, every green tree is far more than if it were made of gold and silver. Many are needed to plant and water. What has been planted now will spread hope and faith for a sustainable future. No matter who plants or waters, nature offers its best. Thank you, dignitaries. Our principal has been a true, true inspiration and guiding force to the students and faculty alike. On this occasion, it gives me great pleasure to invite our beloved principal, Dr. D. Paul Diabrin, to offer felicitation. Esteemed President of the inaugural function of this three-day Hebrew International Conference on Sustainable Environment and Economy, our revered respected Bishop Aya, the Chairman and Secretary of the College, esteemed Chief Guest of the inaugural function, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Periyar Maniamai Institute of Science and Technology, Dr. S. Veli Sami Sir, esteemed Resource Person, Dr. N. C. Gupta, Professor and Dean. University School of Environment Management from Guru Gobind Singh, Indra Prashanta University from New Delhi, beloved Vice Principal, Prasadapa Moses, the head of the Department of Environmental Sciences, and the 
organizing chair of this useful conference, beloved Vice Principal, Self Finance Stream, Dr. Satya Silan, dear co organizing secretaries, the members of faculty of Department of Environmental Studies, my dear colleagues from other departments, dear participants of this conference, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, mom, my warm greetings to all of you. It is indeed a great joy and privilege for me to be with you this morning while the department is thoughtfully organizing this three day international conference in a blended mode, both physically as well as virtually, focusing the theme sustainable environment and economy. First of all, let me sincerely appreciate and congratulate Professor Moses, the organizing chair, and each and everyone who is instrumental for this to happen in our campus, inviting as many academicians, especially in the field, in the field of environmental science, to come to our campus to deliver themselves in as many as uh, five to six plenary sessions in the next three days. Dear friends, of course, as mentioned in the prayer by our beloved Vice Principal, Self Finance Stream, if you refer to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 15, it clearly mentions law took the man and put him in the garden of Eden just to enjoy it, just to work for it, and also to maintain it. So it is in the primary responsibility for all of us is just to maintain this planet Earth for ideal living for all of us as well as for future generations. That's the reason why all these are happening around the world. We talk about many, many things. We have to face a lot of catastrophes, national catastrophes, which we can't avoid. We talk about, we talk about much about uh, climate change. Anyway, we should not succumb to all these problems. Some may be national catastrophes, some we may create without uh, thinking, with, without having loud thinking. Somehow, as environmentalists, as academicians, we should come together and we have to uh, create, we have to make policies. Just now, Mr. Moses, in his remark, of course, the United Nations has thoughtfully uh, pronounced as many goals, as many indicators, uh, as many uh, things which are really considered as predicaments, which we have to overcome that. Dear friends at the juncture, really, we are delighted uh, to have your mistress. Unless these academicians are here and they're going to come tomorrow and day after, definitely this conference would be an eye opener. Actually, what, what's the meaning of uh, environment sustainability? It is just to, we, are, we should be able to maintain a balance. Uh, let us say, we can say, you know, we have to maintain a balance. We can balance the sense, we have to maintain, we must have the ability uh, to have an ecological balance to maintain an ecological balance, just to preserve the natural resources for the ideal living of all of us, in the present generation, and also for the future generation. Dear friends, we're really happy about the Department of Environmental Sciences. Of course, it was introduced way back in 1984. Soon, probably the academic year 2023, 24, 24, 25, is going to be the golden jubilee year for the department. They have grown fully, in fact, we were uh, we were the first of its kind in those days. Our then leaders very thoughtfully, even in 1984, they introduced MSc Environmental Science Sciences, the first of its program, first of its kind in the whole of India. So we must thank the then Vice Chancellor Professor Manisundram sir and our former principal Professor Samiraj sir. Thoughtfully they introduced. Ever since they introduced, plenty of students have studied and they have benefited. Our past students, our alumni friends are around the globe, throughout the globe, and they're doing a great job. I'm glad that, of course, all of us know Moses is the first set of environmental students in Turin. I'm glad that he's going to be here as head of the department while the department is celebrating Golden Jubilee. What a great job it is. I'm sure over the five decades, the department has grown quite a big. Now introduced UG program also. And of course, it's as Moses rightly pointed out, it's an interdisciplinary course. Now we talk about interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. We should not confine to one discipline. In those days, we used to say mathematics is queen of sciences. So without basic sciences, without life sciences, without computational sciences, we can't uh, bring useful to the society. So therefore, to transform the society, all sciences, arts and culture should come together. Then only we can create an ideal atmosphere, environmentally, uh, peacefully, for the ideal living of all the people. Dear friends, 
I don't want to take much time. I'm sure these three days will be beneficial for all the participants. And just I've gone through the brochure. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I must appreciate the organizing team for thoughtfully inviting as many academician scientists across the country, and they are going to be here uh, in, in our campus to reach you, to meet you. Of course, what all we do, we do it only for the student friends. You are the precious. I'm glad that it is, it is being conducted in blended mode. Of course, it is. we, we are also uh, doing uh, virtually. So therefore, even if the participant may not come in person, but they can, list, they can watch uh, through this online connectivity and they can be benefited. I'm sure uh, many, uh, we, can, we can come out, we can arrive. Uh, many thought-provoking ideas which can be implemented. And of course, I'm glad to say our college is a plastic-free campus. And we are using, we have got a biogas bio plant. We have got another plant where we convert waste papers into uh, useful items. We convert waste plastics into useful items. So slowly I must thank the Department of Environmental Science for looking into all um, things. We never uh, just leave as it is. So I'm glad that while we are moving towards the Golden Jubilee of the Department of Environmental Science, we've been doing great things and, and there have been a great support for the management and for the growth of the college. Once again, let me sincerely appreciate and congratulate the organizing chair, the co, the co conveners the co-chairs for their meticulous efforts in organizing this useful conference for the benefit of plenty of students, especially who are in the field of environmental sciences and other scientists. All the best, God bless you all. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking words. Now I request our beloved Bishop, Right Reverend Dr. D. Chandrasegrin, to honor Dr. S. Veluswamy, Vice Chancellor, Periyar Maniamai Institute of Science and Technology, with a shawl and memento. I request Professor A. Alagapa Moses, Vice Principal of Bishop Eber College, to honor our Bishop, Right Reverend Dr. D. Chandra Sekran, with a shawl. I request Dr. C. Ravi Chandran to honor our Bishop with a memento. Now, now, Dr. D. Udaya Banu will honor our principal, Dr. D. Paul Diabran, with a memento. Dr. S. Sugama will honor our vice principal, Professor Alagpa Moses, with a memento. Dr. M. Sheila Mary will now honor our Vice Principal, Dr. J. G. R. Satya Seelan, with a memento. Thank you, dignitaries. The Book of Abstracts is a testament to the hard work and dedication of our authors who have contributed their research and knowledge to this compilation. It is a pleasure to invite Dr. Velu Sami to officially release the Book of Abstracts. The first copy of the book of abstracts will be received by the dignitaries on the stage.
Thank you, dignitaries. Being the sixth bishop of Trichy Tanju Diocese of the Church of South India, Right Reverend Dr. D. Chandrasekharan has been elevated to this high office after a long and effective ministry as an active and committed presbyter, DCC chairman and clerical secretary. Bishop started his ministry as the pioneering missionary in Pachamalai Tribal Mission, Salem, in the year 1983. He has done his doctorate from the Tamil University, Tanjur. I take immense pleasure in inviting our beloved Bishop, Right Reverend Dr. D. Chandrasegran, Chairman and Secretary of a College to deliver the Presidential Address. Esteemed Chief Guest of this uh, three-day <coughs> International Conference, Sustainable Environment and Economy, and Dr. Paul Dayabaran, the principal of the college, and Dr. Gupta, the eminent scholar who has come all the way from Delhi, and Dr. Alahappa Moses, the head of the department and the vice principal, Dr. Satishilan, the vice principal, Dr. Ravichandran, Dr. Sheila, Dr. Banu, Dr. Shukumar, uh, were all sharing a, a lot of responsibility during organizing this uh, international conference. And uh, Dr. Kumaran, our illustrious anime, we are so proud of you, sir. We are so proud of you. And uh, Dr. Gideon, Dr. Priscilla, all the heads of uh, departments. And it gives me immense pleasure to preside over this uh, international conference. I feel that this is a need of the world. When you get up in the morning, when the world wake up in the morning, we confront two realities. Number one, the depletion and destruction of earth and its resources. Number two, the cry for human existence, for a dignified life. I think these are the two realities that we confront every day in our life. As uh, scholars, as students, particularly the students of environment science, we have to address this issue. It's a very important thing. And now, uh, in those days, we had little awareness about the environmental issues. But now, people are, people are having more awareness after the natural calamities like earthquake and uh, tsunami and COVID and all these things, you know, has uh, given us some kind of uh, understanding and we have learned to listen in a very hard way. So this is a high time for people to think about the environmental issues. Particularly environmental issues has a lot of implication with the economy. That is also very important. As we all know, the, the issues that the entire world is global level. Uh, issue is the global warming eh? everywhere where, where, wherever we go people talk about it and it affects the entire uh, global economy we all know that and uh, as Karl Marx some 100 years back he was the one who declared economy is the superstructure on which every community nation is built and of course it is there the economy is the basic uh, thing that uh, community but more than, there are a lot of dimensions in the community, but one major factor is economy. So environmental issues has a lot of implications, connection, link with the economy of the community. Uh, this is something very interesting and uh, I'm very, uh, uh, very happy and I want to congratulate the uh, head of the Department of Environment, Environment Sciences, Dr. Alahappa Moses, and other people responsible for organizing this international conference. This is a very important thing. And particularly, yes, we, before we came to this meeting, we just we were um, casually talking about the certain issues that we confront every day. And I, when I heard that Dr. Gupta has come all the way from Delhi, I told him, Delhi is the place where you uh, confront a lot of uh, environmental issues. He started telling him uh, that pollution and other things. Dr. Vail Swami sir was also sharing some of things, but Dr. Vail Swami sir, our esteemed chief guest, was mentioning something which touched my 
uh, heart. See, there is a change in the culture of a people. See, culture is a very dynamic factor. So there is a change in the culture, culture because everything is connected with the nature. So you just take uh, water resources, okay? We are deprived of water resources. We, we never even thought, we never even imagined that it would happen. And I still remember uh, when I was studying in a school, I bought a, uh, my father gave me some money, I bought a pen and I used it for five years till I reached 11th standard. But what happens, now there is a culture, no? use and throw. You buy something and use it and throw. The same, see, these are the dynamics of culture, which has a very strong implication with our own understanding of responsibility towards nature. So these are very, very important issues to be discussed. Particularly, the economy is very important, as you know, after the COVID situation. And the entire nation, the global level economic crisis is there. A few months back, we were in um, UK. Of course, many times we see the UK for summer for our meetings and other things. We are so shocked to know the country which was enjoying all kind of economic facilities and advancement, now they feel it's very hard time for them to have a sustainable economy. And three prime ministers continuously resigned, not able to have a stable government stability ensured in the economic sphere of the life. So these are the very important things that we come across. And I'm very happy that uh, this three days conference will help you to understand more deeply about the challenges that we face. As our principal has rightly pointed out, this is a time that we have to talk about the balance, environmental balance, which will certainly, definitely, obviously, will help us to have some kind of stable economy uh, in the community. So with these words, I want to conclude my presidential address, I am very, I congratulate uh, all of the students community also for uh, uh, getting this opportunity to think very seriously, think and deliberate and discuss and understand the dynamics that we face in the day to day uh, challenge in our life. Uh, may God continue to help you and I wish all the best. And we have got very eminent uh, scholars, resource persons address, uh, addressing to the community for the three days conference and definitely it's going to be an eye-opener for all of us and uh, you may think that what is what the bishop has to do with the environment and the economy see spirituality and religion as i was talking to dr gupta also the any religion which has uh, because it is human oriented you see is human is the center of any religion so when we talk about religion, spirituality, obviously we have to come across the question challenges of environmental economy. So all the best. May God continue to help you. And my sincere thanks to Dr. Alakapa Moses for inviting me. And most of the time people come and invite me and last minute I will cancel it. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy today. I am able to may, make it. And thank you very much. My sincere appreciation to Dr. Paul Dayabran, who gives a very good leadership to the college. And thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aya. An eminent senior academician, Dr. S. Velusami, has dedicated 36 years towards mentoring and inspiring students. He has held positions like professor, dean, principal, advisor, and numerous other administrative roles throughout his career. From tutoring students to guiding scholars, Dr. S. Velusami has proven track record not only as an academician, but also an able administrator. He has received many funds and awards and also contributed to the Asia Books of Record. It is an honor and privilege to have amidst us Dr. S. Velusami, Vice Chancellor of Periyar Maniyamai Institute of Science and Technology. We invite you, sir, to render the inaugural address. Very pleasant. Good morning to all of you, both joined in online and offline. <clears throat> beloved uh, <clears throat> president of uh, this function, 
Dr. D. Sandrasan Sir, Chairman and Secretary, Bishop Kippur College, Tirchapali, who has uh, <coughs> delivered a highly informative presidential address, and <coughs> Vice Principal and Head of the Organizing Chair of this international conference, Professor Alapa Moses, who has given a pleasant welcome address, and uh, <coughs> Principal of uh, this institute, Dr. D. Paul Denagrant sir, who has given a, <coughs> a, a, a felicitation address on this uh, happiest occasion. And uh, UG coordinator, uh, co-organizing chair of uh, this international conference, Dr. C. Ravichandran, who is going to deliver what of thanks on this occasion. Other organizing uh, committee members, uh, Dr. A. Daisy, Caroline Mary, and uh, <coughs> Dr. D. Udayabhanu and uh, Dr. S. Uh, Sugumar and uh, other uh, dignitaries uh, <coughs> who has come for, for this international conference uh, to deliver uh, <coughs> a special address. Dr. Gupta, Director IPU, Indra Prasad University, Delhi and the other uh, staff members of uh, <coughs> the, <coughs> the Department of uh, uh, Environmental Sciences and uh, <coughs> Uh, staff and student friends of uh, this Bishop Kipper College and my colleague, Dr. Kumran, I invited guests, and <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, and participants, uh, mainly the participants of this international conference. <coughs> it gives me immense pleasure uh, to be with you in the pleasant morning and uh, participate uh, in the inaugural function of uh, this three-day Heber International Conference on Sustainable Environment Economy Towards Transforming the World by 2020. On this uh, memorable and happiest occasion, on behalf of the esteemed Chancellor of uh, Periyar Manima Institute of Science and Technology, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Viramani Asriyar Ayasar, and on behalf of the, <coughs> uh, uh, the Periyar Manima Institute, and my own behalf, on the eve of uh, Forest Day, I convey my heartiest greetings and best wishes for all of you and also the every success of this international conference. First of all, I should congratulate the organizing committee, the organizing this uh, uh, international conference in a very grand manner. Uh, mainly the arrangement is so meticulous. Uh, I am extremely very happy uh, that uh, we, we have started this uh, event, but just pouring water to a plant. Uh, this is the first time uh, in my career I have done the inauguration like this. Uh, so first of all, I thank you for that. And I uh, also thank, uh, uh, as Sar was saying that, you know, you have been invited mainly uh, you are maintaining a, a good campus in our institute, the zero carbon. This was net zero carbon, uh, mainly because of your student you have given to us, Dr. Kumarin and others. Uh, so we have conducted a number of uh, I mean, international conferences, uh, a number of training also for staff and other students. Uh, probably you are aware that uh, we are also creating awareness nearby villages. About 67 villages we adopted and uh, we are also... Uh, uh, mainly uh, get training them uh, to maintain uh, the biodiversity and uh, mainly the, uh, the agriculture, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, mainly production uh, without chemicals, uh, uh, natural product, how can you, they can do it and all that. We are doing it. Uh, so I'm also very happy, sir. I've come on another a beautiful green campus. Uh, uh, so thanks for uh, inviting me uh, for this conference. I thank the management and uh, mainly the organizing secretary and other organizing committee members. Uh, <clears throat> so I feel uh, very happy uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, the conference on sustainable environment economy uh, is, is initiated by PG and Research Department of Environment Science. Um, <clears throat> So the theme of uh, uh, this conference, if you look at it, uh, the National Science Day is 2023 is Global Science for Global Wellbeing. So I appreciate that you have also chosen the conference topic in line with the both themes uh, this year. 
and <clears throat> and uh, it also coincides with the uh, India's uh, assumption of the presidency of the G20. Uh, the India G20 priority is, if you look at it, the green development and climate finance and lifestyle for environment. So keeping this, uh, uh, I mean, you have uh, the, the topic uh, is uh, you have chosen a, a right way to propagate this. The slogan uh, for G20, uh, the India has chosen is uh, yeah, one earth, uh, one family and one future. Uh, if you look at it, it's only one way. You, you just look at it. We are imagining too much. Say so we have only uh, like a one house, the whole uh, human uh, uh, creature uh, living in a, a single roof. Nowadays, because of ICT technology, whole world is under a single roof. Single roof, probably you heard in a tetrosphere and stratosphere. A tetrosphere is almost like a glass house from ground to about 10 to 12 kilometers radius yeah, throughout a planet. That place alone, we can live happily. Beyond that, you have to put mask. As the Delhi people used to put mask <laughs> during uh, pollution days. So beyond that, we cannot be able to live. So this room is there. We are keeping it clean, neat, tidy. And we leave this also a future generation the same way are uh, in a still better way. We equip them better way. And that is what we expect. So <clears throat> we have to thank the, our forefathers or the, our seniors. The, those have actually given this great opportunity to live happily and uh, <clears throat> in, 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 are creating a healthy environment to live. <clears throat> so if you are not leaving the, for future generation, a still comfortable uh, <coughs> place or uh, a comfortable uh, I mean world, definitely they will, uh, you know, what the sin they have committed or you have not done your justice. Normally we used to say, we will normally so we are not giving uh, 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 I, I mean, uh, we, we, are, we are not showing any gratitude for a past generation and also the future generation. We are not leaving anything uh, uh, to live comfortably. That means we are committing some crime or justice, injustice. So what we expect from everybody is to see to that our earth is the one, the earth is beautifully you have to maintain. Because we, we are uh, we are talking about the our nation is beautiful nation. Uh, we, we want to make uh, 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 still, uh, I mean, environment friendly or uh, uh, create a healthy environment and so on. Uh, but all that should uh, provide, unless otherwise, if you look at it, you live as a, a f a, a one, one family. The reason now, probably you can understand that, now, Russia and uh, Ukraine war, probably you are aware that because of this, how much damage they are doing it to nature is alarming, isn't it? It's a natural disaster. Uh, we, we normally do that. This is a man-made disaster. So the natural disaster, as, because of man-made disaster, natural disaster also occurs. I mean, needless to say, the SAR is there uh, uh, to give all details. Uh, uh, what is uh, why natural disaster is coming and uh, why why the people are uh, the society is not harmonious there is uh, what you call uh, is, is a man uh, generally uh, the disaster made by a human being is quite a lot uh, even recent uh, the covid uh, 19 also people used to say uh, this is actually uh, generated in wogan uh, the, the the biological war uh, the, the, mainly the uh, uh, lab of uh, uh, and, uh, they're carrying out various tests uh, to produce biological weapon. That's what I heard rather. Probably uh, they escaped from the lab that uh, how much it harmed the whole world. Probably you understand that. So such type of uh, natural uh, uh, man-made disaster, do you expect that? 
Uh, so we are not for that. So the whatever the technology we develop should be environment friendly or eco friendly. <clears throat> if you look at it uh, in uh, in the mainly uh, the, the nowadays, if you look at uh, the global population, it is increasing alarming rate. So almost uh, it will reach uh, in another 20 years or to 10 billion. They, they are changing their lifestyle, consumer culture, development uh, projects, overutilize all the available natural resources. All that definitely uh, spoil our world. The, the collective responsibility is uh, look, uh, look at it. A individual now the alarming uh, the, the mainly the challenges if you look at it the modern lifestyle and political ecological condition political economy and development project a number of natural and man-made disaster and also going up and millions of people become victims of uh, disasters probably you can understand that uh, and uh, Probably the even uh, the natural disaster after uh, impact of uh, COVID-19, uh, even Delhi people are very happy. Uh, one way, uh, the unhappy that because of COVID-19, after that they're happy. The reason is, there's a study, the impact of COVID-19 on environment. The study indicates that the pandemic situation is sig uh, uh, significantly improves air quality in different cities across the world, reduces greenhouse gases emission <clears throat> actually the water uh, actually water pollution is also reduced and the noise and reduces the uh, 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 mainly the poisonous gas and other uh, 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 even chemicals which may uh, and not only that uh, uh, and, uh, if you look at it uh, uh, other disasters uh, in a in a uh, the day to day life, uh, the natural disaster like recently you experienced uh, at, uh, at in Turkey, uh, so that is a natural disaster. Uh, why natural disaster occurs? <clears throat> so because of uh, uh, I, I mean you you cannot uh, imagine rather, but are we handling the planet properly? I, I, are we damaging the climate or the planet uh, even worst way? So nowadays you can look at it. The energy is much, much important because of that we are, uh, uh, I mean, building a power plant, not only an ordinary power plant, super th power plant, super thermal power plant, all that. Now uh, look at it, uh, all f f fossil fuel power plants, <laughs> they're based on, <clears throat> I mean, lignite or oil. So this excavation, we are just uh, deeply uh, cutting the uh, I mean, soil and uh, taking away uh, and uh, we're transporting it. Not only that, we are burning it and the, the poisonous gases are spoiling the air. After all, for human being, what they expect, we need a good air to breathe, good water to drink, good food to eat, good shelter. So we are enjoying it. We should leave the same to the future generation also, isn't it? So for that only, we are doing all this. Even this conference also uh, teach this. Now we talk about even cities is become mega cities, uh, ordinary, uh, uh, I mean, dam. It's not nowadays, not uh, small dams, large dams. As I said, you're not small power plant, a uh, uh, super th power plant, a super thermal power plant not small industry or a big industry. That's why we are talking about automation because of IC technology, the industrial 4.0. Now the automation is order of the day. For that only the new technology like uh, the artificial intelligence, IoT, robotics, all that machine language, everything uh, new technology has come up and uh, not necessary you have to go and work and from you're sitting in a home, you can command and control everything, that automation, but at what cost? And uh, what damage you are doing it to the nature, that is a thing you have to pr probably observe rather. And uh, mainly the uh, sustain, uh, I mean, su sustainability development, if you look at it, uh, you have chosen environment and uh, probably the economy. 
actually the sustainable development can be thought of in terms of the three that normally people used to say three spheres or three pillars or three dimensions, three domains or we used to call triple bottom line theory and i don't know the why the conference has chosen environment and economy i'm not blaming it we are for only economy any country we want to be strong in economy after that only we think about environment we won't bother about anything probably uh, the economy we have given top priority that's another reason the, we are thinking about env environment probably after that they will think about the society but this is other way about it the society is not strong the economy development won't come economy is not there and uh, the vice versa uh, environment won't come environment is not good economy won't come it's all the interrelated that's the reason you know this is what you call a triple bottom line theory or the concept is what you call a three pillars uh, to, to build uh, the, uh, mainly the environment sustainability you look at it uh, even sometimes you know this have, people have extended ecology economics and uh, politics and culture so the, you want to improve ecology the economics is also important. Then political policy, many, many the uh, politics here, the policies made by government. The government changes, policy, all that changes, everything will change. Environment also will change. Isn't it? They, they, we want to make industrial nation or we want to make, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the atomic power plant. You make all, everything atomic power, you close all other plants. Yeah, some of the policy changes comes, but the policy other way about use only renewable energy stop all other uh, <coughs> energies probably that will make environment friendly situation so the that's why probably they added and the culture that say uh, initiated rather you know culture is much much important even your educator or uneducated doesn't matter that should have a passion to everybody uh, and not only that that should be a universe <coughs> In the environment, the eco friendly environment we have to create, that should be religion of everybody. Unless otherwise it comes out, that sort of culture, it won't come out. I, I doubt very much uh, we can have a, a create a, a, a good climate, uh, or you cannot, you, you, you may not be able to have a, a beautiful planet or the world. So, mainly the, the triple bottom theory, uh, the concept is. Actually, the economic dimension, we normally think about profit and uh, so social dimension, normally we think about people and uh, environment direction, think about planet. So the three P's we used to call profit, people uh, and planet, the environment and uh, society and economy. We can put it other way, profit, uh, people and planet among the uh, these three dimension. Economic dimension is often chosen as the most in, important one by most countries. That's the reason uh, you have chosen uh, environment and economy. That's the reason. I'm not just blaming you, sir. And we have given a top priority for that. And uh, so in this, if you look at it, sir, so among the three dimensions, uh, no matter where a country uh, is... Uh, 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 a development level metri mainly a developed country may not have sometimes you know environment uh, 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 environmental stability uh, so the environment stability exists you cannot ensure that economically strong sometimes you know you are not affordable to buy most of the things you uh, see you look at it even our own like day to day life you can see that a rich person you look at it, the house, I do not want to say somebody is having 600 workers in their house, so many floors, what is the necessity? And he's wasting most of the things. So same way, a country which is very rich, they spoil their own country. And not only that, you should be you should have a good relation with the neighbors. Sometimes, you know, you have a house, we have some dirt. You throw it in neighbor house. The same way, uh, big countries, leading countries, they are throwing their own waste, or dump their own waste to other countries. That is what is happening. 
So that's the reason, one of the reasons I used to say, the culture has to be changed. And we should treat everybody is equal. Yeah, that's why uh, even now, uh, uh, our own, uh, you mean the, the concept, uh, mainly the, it has come rather, um, <coughs> not only that uh, so, uh, so society, the economy and the environment and equity. Equity, treat everybody is equal. Uh, so that is the, what you call uh, the dribble bottom theory. People also talked uh, in other way also. Uh, so I want to just make uh, some of the conclusions, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, the sustainability. <clears throat> According to triple bottom line theory, in order to form a real long-term sustainable pattern, all three dimensions need to be met simultaneously in the center of the three rings. Uh, normal, uh, three rings sporting, na? If you look at it, it should occupy a sustainability. So. Uh, there should be a compromise we used to call optimization. So optimization comes in the society and uh, economy and uh, environment should work together in a harmonious manner. Then only you can attain a sustainability. A country may be <coughs> economically sustainable. However, the economic sustainability won't last if social sustainability and the environmental sustainability are not established simultaneously. You may country may be rich, like Ukraine. Ukraine, you know, because of policy, and Russia also. The other way, it is also affected. Neighbor should be a friendly. Uh, the culture is not good. They are not treating e each other equally. Similarly, if a country is socially sustainable, but not in economically and environmentally sustainable, their social sustainability won't last long either. So you say that the country is so I'm a cultured man, I'm a highly cultured man. You can say that, but uh, if you are so, but not economically, you are sound. We are not economically sound. Then environment sustainability you cannot expect. But, but so to maintain in, 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 environment sustainability, you have to spend something also. That's more important. Otherwise, uh, I, I, we should have. Then only we can have options. We have to go for renewable energy. Now you have to invest. Isn't it? Therefore, if mo most consist in the world uh, have focused a lot in their economic dimension, how about other two dimensions, social dimension and environment dimensions? And uh, <clears throat> the Robico Sam's country sustainability ranking will be used to examine the efforts of major countries in the world on environment dimension and social dimension. So <clears throat> the analysis, a typical analysis, a Robica Soms uh, country sustainable, uh, sustainability ranking, uh, there's a typical study is there. Based on the study, the conclusion what they made is, what has set all the countries apart from each other, especially set developing countries apart from developing nations, is neither their environmental scores nor social scores. Instead, the economic carry out uh, uh, contributes the most of a country's overall sustainability ranking. Mainly the economic uh, contribution is much, much more on sustainable ranking. And uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, according to Maslow's theory, he has uh, used a psychological factors and not, uh, I mean, like, uh, the, like in the environment, as I said, these three pillars, they have not used it. Yeah, psychological needs like human uh, survival, uh, food, water, and shelter, and so on. Then safety needs. Then love and affection, our belongings, esteem, self-actualization. Uh, they used this sort of concept. So really, a person is fulfilled with all this. What will be about the nature of uh, uh, the environment? Following the above analysis, it is uh, uh, reasonable to assume that in a developed country, when a people have more levels of needs and uh, fulfilled, they are more likely to reach the level of self uh, transcendences. In turn, they should be more likely to be environmental sustainable. So you are fully satisfied now, probably in all means. The fully satisfied now, you should be healthy and uh, you should be comfortable. You should be happy. If that is the case, the environmental uh, sustainability exists. Otherwise, you are psychologically affected. You are not healthy. This sort of thing occurs 
you can say that this is the main uh, mainly the factors which are coming into picture uh, i mean the basic need is not fulfilled as i said food shelter all that not fulfilled then you cannot achieve the environment sustainability like that there is another concept we used to call epi score based on that they have also made conclusion that for countries which are less economically developed the less economically developed developing countries they are the the environmental sustainability has less less environmental sustainability a developing country definitely it has a less uh, uh, environmental sustainability uh, based on what you call uh, the epi score people have carried carry out various type of analysis like this the relationship is between environmental sustainability and the economic development the interrelations by carrying out various studies by collecting various data from various countries now <clears throat> Uh, I mean, people have come to number of conclusions. So finally, what we need is uh, we we have to create a, a, a good world to live comfortably. Uh, for that, uh, as uh, youngsters, what you have to do it that that is much much important. So for that, uh, the main objective is, yeah, as I said, rather, uh, whatever you talk about it, you uh, for create a. A, a good world we need a, 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 a service mind a service you have to sacrifice sacrifice it doesn't mean that you have to have a hundred percent so because of uh, so many people they yes, sacrifice their own lives we are living comfortably in the same way either individual or a country or the world or world leaders to, sac to have a service mind a sacrifice something uh, to the society unless otherwise the climate uh, or uh, the world definitely will be polluted rather and uh, in this line you look at it for that what we need is a good education and uh, the good education only will may provide values to a human being unless there is who have values values and ethics even professional ethics you have corruptions all that even profession you do that you will spoil we are going for certification green certification industry pollution certification all that we are going if you have uh, you, there is a corruption involved man, so you will certify by getting away my taking away money uh, so uh, so this professional ethics should be maintained apart from that value should be, the people you should take a pledge that i won't spoil the atmosphere i won't uh, uh, i mean create i mean i, I won't uh, you mean unnecessarily use i try mainly even the conserve energy yeah conserve anything i won't waste anything that, that sort of pledge probably you have to take so that sort of uh, i mean culture it has to come for that education is that, that that is must so that is the one of the reason our forefathers they created number of education institution even the bishop keeper the college has come to create education because of that only we are able to sit and discuss these things so even uh, our institute tandai periyar uh, so he has given high importance uh, to disciplines first a discipline is there in discipline all walk of life you should not waste things you should not spoil others spoil things and not only that uh, and uh, uh, then you have discipline education will automatically come so uh, you should provide the same way the education and environment side uh, you have to provide that uh, now the mandatory course for everybody they have given environmental science i hope that not uh, that is not alone not sufficient you should make them to practice and that only make practice makes perfection so the that you have to create among youngsters i hope the number of participants have come the leading personalities have come to uh, uh, guide you and uh, <coughs> the conference the three day conference don't think that it is over after that you should keep uh, touch with uh, others and uh, form a team and so that we some of you emulate that is the great uh, uh, our contribute something on environment or climate change uh, development that is the great contribution or great success of this international conference so thank you very much for giving the great opportunity and uh, i hope that you will go back uh, 
uh, your place with the good memory, a green memory of the, the great uh, uh, the contributions uh, made various people. And you can continue our research and contribute to the society. I wish you all the best. Thank you for, uh, very much for the opportunity. Thank you, sir, for your cultural insights and encouragement towards new beginnings. I appreciate all the delegates and the audience for your enthusiasm. We hope you have a fruitful experience. Now that the conference has been gracefully inaugurated, we shall move on to the next plenary and technical sessions. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Before that, let us break for tea. Refreshments are being served outside the hall. Kindly help yourselves. Please be back in the same hall for the first plenary session, which will commence at 11.45 a.m.
ஒரு ரூமுக்கு போயிருந்தோம்
Plenary session will commence in another few minutes. I request the participants to assemble back to the hall to grab the most knowledge. Participants, your kind attention. Plenary session will commence in another few minutes. I request the participants to assemble back to the hall to grab the most knowledge. Thank you. We request the participants to occupy the friend seats. Thank you. For your kind attention, plenary session will commence in another few minutes. I request the participants to assemble back to the hall to grab the most knowledge. Thank you. I request the participants to occupy the friend seats. Thank you.
an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. I welcome and invite all the interested participants for the plenary session one. I'd like to invite Dr. Gupta to occupy the dais. Now I call forth Professor A. Alagappa Moses, Vice Principal of Bishop Eber College, to offer our guest, Dr. Gupta, with a memento. I call forth Dr. C. Ravichandran, Associate Professor and UG Coordinator, Department of Environmental Sciences, to introduce the plenary speaker. Respected Vice Principal, Professor Adagapa Moses. And Honorable Guest Speaker of this plenary session, Professor Gupta. Faculty members, from other departments and uh, participants and my dear students, very good forenoon to all of you. Indeed, it's my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, the first speaker of the first plenary session, Dr. N. C. Gupta, Professor and Dean, University of University School of Environmental Management. He is uh, hailing from, he is currently director of Indraprastha University Innovation and Incubation Foundation of GGS Indraprastha University. That is GGS means Guru Gobind Singh, Indraprastha University, Delhi. He also served as Dean of School and Director of Research and Consultancy in the University. Right now, he is working as a professor with the University of, I'm sorry, with the University School of Environmental Management. He obtained his MPhil and PhD in Energy and Environment Systems from the prestigious University, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He is one of the founder members of University School of Environmental Management, Center for Disaster Management Studies in the University. Indraprastha University. He was also a postdoctoral fellow with the Energy and Biomass Con Conversion Laboratory of Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Delhi, and researcher with the Radio and Atmospheric Science Division of National Physical Laboratory Delhi. He is having more than 32 years of research experience and uh, 24 years of teaching experience to MSc Environmental Management. MSc Natural Resource Management, B.Tech and M.Tech Chemical Technology, and also MBA Disaster Management and PhD courses. He was instrumental in setting up of major laboratories of energy and climate change laboratory and air and water analysis laboratory in the University of University School of Environmental Management. He has instructed a wide variety of courses, which includes energy. Environment and Technology, EAA, Air Pollution and Health, Climate Change, Carbon Management, Disaster Management, and Environmental Risk Analysis. He has supervised so far more than 12 doctoral theses and more than 150 dissertations, MSc, uh, and also B.Tech and M.Tech and MBA programs. And... Uh, <clears throat> He has carried out consultancy assignment for NTPC, National Thermal Power Corporation and IPGCL Power Plants, Larson and Tubro, National Mission on Bamboo Application and major research projects of UGC. He was uh, training and place, placement in charge and coordinator of the school over a decade. He has delivered several lectures and chaired uh, sessions on energy, air pollution, climate change, and environmental protection and on pollution control throughout India and abroad. 
He has published more than 100 research papers in international journals and national journals. He is currently part of multilateral international project of 35 million euro on decarbonization of industry through carbon capture. He is a member of various DST committees on international multilateral relations committee, MOEFCC, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change Committee and member of Executive Council and Board of Studies of several central and state universities. He is, in editorial, uh, he is an editorial board member of international peer-reviewed journals and is a reviewer for several high-impact reputed international journals. So we have a very important and eminent person in the field of environmental management. And uh, it is uh, we are really honored by his presence. And uh, you may be wondering how uh, I, uh, uh, we could contact him and uh, how we could invite him. Actually, when I did my PhD in uh, JNU, he was also doing PhD and, uh, and he was my junior at the time. Now he has become professor in the university and also uh, actually I, uh, uh, we lost contact for more than 30 years. But thanks to the internet, through internet I could, uh, uh, I, I, I was able to find out him and uh, this is how we fixed him. So uh, we are highly honored to have uh, here, uh, uh, have uh, Professor Gupta with us and we are ready to hear his speech on uh, carbon, uh, how to uh, capture the carbon and uh, the implications of carbon capture. So thank you very much. On behalf of all of us gathered here, I once again welcome you over to Professor Gupta. We take, we take great pride in inviting Dr. N. C. Gupta to share his expertise on the impact of post-combustion carbon capture technology on vegetation, soil, and water a climate change and carbon sequestration perspective. Uh, esteemed uh, Principal Dr. D. Paul Diyabaran, Principal Bishop Hever College, Tirchi, and esteemed uh, Vice Principal uh, Professor A. Alagappa Moshe uh, and Dr. J. G. R. Satish, Seelan, uh, Vice Principal of Bishop Heber College, uh, and uh, Dr. C. Ravi Chandran uh, for inviting me uh, uh, for uh, this lecture in this uh, very prestigious Heber International Conference on Sustainable Environment and Economy. Am I audible? Yeah. So uh, I think introduction is already done by. Uh, Professor Siravi Chandran. Actually, I come from, uh, I will brief tell about my university. I come from uh, Guru Gobind Singh Indrapastha University, known as commonly IP University. In people call it in short IP University. Actually, it was Indrapastha University and it came up in 1999. And that time, you know, 300 years of Khalsa, you know, the establishment of Sikh, you know, of this religion were completed. And that time, Chief Minister was Hila Dixit. She requested the Vice Chancellor to rename the university as a Guru Gobind Singh and Drapastha University. We started master's program in Guru Gobind Singh and Drapastha University or IP University in 1999, MSc in Environment Management and PhD program. Then in 2008, we started MSc in Biodiversity and Conservation with 20 seats. Then 2012, we again introduced one. Another, you know, MSc program on the demand of the, you know, peers and stakeholders, MSc in natural resources management. So currently we are running the three MSc programs and PhD program. One thing is very unique in our university, particularly in PhD program. I invite you all who do MSc from here to join PhD program in our university. On 19th of this month, the basically the portal is op open. And the beauty is that anybody who gets admission in PhD in IP University, 25,000 fellowship is mandatory. 
certainly you will give have each and everybody irrespective you qualify the net or not if you qualify net with jrf you can come with your own fellowship and if you don't have any fellowship just you have msc with 55% marks and you qualify our pet phd test you know this uh, phd entrance test pet of ip university everybody gets fellowship 25000 per month and mean people who don't have any funding they join the phd program they write ugc net or jrf they qualify the net with jrf then they resign from university fellowship they join and their fellowship so i invite you all you know who so over pass out msc program from here some of you must try you know that phd program in ip university every year we take around 10 15 seats every year and fellowship is compulsory after 6 month when you qualify when you pass the course work which is a mandatory course work of 12 credit of ugc everybody after 6 month start getting fellowship for 5 years 3 years straight after that they review if we publish one paper after 3 years it's again pre continued fellowship so i request you at least you try the pt portal is open if M there are students who will pass out msc i will send you link also sri ravi chandran for this phd pt a test some of you right i am there i am also sitting in the interview committee because we are getting very less people from south india so we think we can work on the coastal areas if we get the people from you know those who are living near by the sea so those problems we can also address in our university so once again thank you very much for inviting me for this lecture there is a minor change in the basically in the lecture title i will basically discuss today the recent advances in carbon capture utilization and storage ccus is a very new topic basically uh, in india a climate change and carbon sequestration perspective this topic basically deliberately i i, I have chosen because i am having a project of this as i uh, i think ravi chandra told this is 3.7 million euro you know basically of rcn research council of norway basically we are the part of this project with iit khadakpur so this is very eye opener and very important you know area of research particularly for those who are just passing out msc and they want to enter into the you know research arena so now what i will discuss in this lecture today the brief outlines i will to background and what is the motivation of this and uh, co2 emissions in india scenarios and sector wise co2 emissions in india then what why there is a need for decarbonization of industry why industry like i was very happy in morning session when the vice chancellor was telling that our campus is net zero and i was surprised because india's mission is to become net zero by 2070 and these universities you know in today's concern you know uh, uh, concern is net zero so they are running ahead of the time and carbon capture utilization and storage then environmental benefits of ccus what are the risk associated with the ccus and what is the public perception of carbon capture utilization and storage and what are the government efforts to develop the ccus in india and action by indian industries then i will sum up the lecture if you see the background you know in 2014 before the paris agreement the world was on track to heat up nearly 4 degrees celsius by the end of this century by the end of the means by the end of this century an outcome that is widely seen as catastrophic then you know there there was a uh, cop in uh, in in paris so the they decided to control the temperature now today now the thanks to rapid growth in the clean energy particularly solar and wind in india and world over humanity has started to bend the emission curve if you see the, this emission curve this was basically pre paris uh sorry yeah yes uh if you see this pre paris this curve was you know global greenhouse gas emissions pathways and this historic this is business as usual 
free Paris. Then, you know, the current policies can bend this curve to here. And the players basically we have taken uh, this basically will go up to the up to here. And with this, you know, we have we want to control the basically the climate or we want to achieve this. This temperature should not rise by the end of this century 1.5 degrees Celsius. Then we have to bend the curve up to here. Now, what CO2 emissions by 2020? By region per capita growth, if you see here, the Middle East, the Saudi Arabia, because their per capita income is very high, already very prosperous economies because of oil and other resources, like if you see Australia, New Zealand, and USA, so CO2 emissions per capita, they are more than 10 you know, tons per year. But if you see, for India, we are here. Per capita CO2 emissions, India's per capita CO2 emissions, if you compare with the developed countries, even with China, are very less. In If you see Africa, without South Africa, because South Africa, again, is a developed country. So without South Africa, you see the Africa, you know, very per capita CO2 emissions in tons are also very, very low. And if you see the background carbon intensity of power sector, means when you generate one kilowatt of power, one unit of power through thermal, how much CO2 you emit in the atmosphere? Here if you see, India gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour per unit of electricity is 771.3. And if you see United States 455 and you see the European Union only 314. So if you see the world average of 506 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity, we are emitting 52% higher of the world average. That means there is a lot of scope to improve the efficiency of our existing thermal power plants. Then you see CO2 potential utilization and removal pathways. Now, what are the, if you see here, the, the energy sector, how much energy sector in it emits the CO2, 13 gigatons. G means gigatons, you know, 10 to the power 9 or billion tons or gigatons, same thing. 13 gigatons CO2 and buildings, construction, you know, 3 gigatons of CO2 and industry, 7 gigatons of CO2. And this is a transport, 7 gigatons of CO2, agriculture, 4 gigatons of CO2. Then land use changes, 5 gigatons uh, tons of you know, CO2. And this sinks are only 12 and 9 because land sinks, you know, biomass growth. Plants, they can absorb up to only 12 gigatons of CO2. And water bodies, ocean, they can basically, they can absorb only 9 gigatons of CO2. And there is a net, you know, see the currently, when we talk about net zero for the world, currently you see 17 gigaton of CO2 is basically, is not balancing, it is more, you know, 17 gigatons more we are basically emitting into the atmosphere because net zero is not there, net balance is extra we are emitting into the atmosphere. So they are basically the pathways, maybe chemicals from CO2, fuels you can make from CO2, products, you can make concrete buildings, materials, CO2, this EOR. Basically, you can, when you talk about the this EOR, how you can inject the CO2 into the ground and you can, uh, you can make the enhanced oil recovery from the CO2. Then there is another, you know, forestry techniques can also absorb the CO2 and soil carbon sequestration techniques are there and then biochar. Then comes CO2 emissions in India. How much CO2 basically we are emitting into the atmosphere? You see, this total, India is the third largest emitter of CO2 after USA and China. Third largest emitter. And presently, we emit around 
2.65 gigaton of CO2 every year, each year annually, which is approximately 7% of the world's total CO2 emissions. And if you do by type, like coal is a major emitter, then oil, then gas, then cement, then gas flaring into the atmosphere, then sector-wise CO2, when you talk about the sector-wise CO2 emissions, you see, we, by 2020 CO2 emission, I, by 2030 CO2 emissions, of course, the CO2 emissions will increase by 2030. Currently, you see this, the major, basically, the power sector is emitting a more than 1,000 you know, gigaton of CO2. And this oil and gas, refinery and chemicals, 125 gigaton of CO2. Then iron and steel is also a major one to contribute to the CO2 emission. And then comes the cement industry, then natural gas-based, you know, hydrogen production. And this coal gasification, coal gasification is not here, but in days to come, because coal, we are having a 105 billion tons of coal reserves. We cannot compromise with the coal because we, the, we are not having a gas reserve, we are not having a oil reserves. 105 tons of coal reserves and that is the, one of the biggest coal reserves in the world after China, Russia and USA. So now we, black, black is beautiful, but point is that the coal comes with a lot of environmental liabilities. So how we can reduce, if you want to use the coal in a sustainable way, or if you want to use the coal in a friendly way, then there is a process known as the coal gasification. Because what is coal? In scientific environmental terms, the coal basically is a, is a basically compound of CHNSO, C carbon, H hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, if you remove it, and oxygen, CHNSO. The elements of coal are CHNSO. So if you gasify the coal, if you gasify the coal, then you can basically convert the coal into the, you know, gaseous fuel. And gaseous fuel basically is very friendly to the automation. Automation you can easily do with the coal. So be basically the technologies are required for India for sustainable use, for power generation, for energy generation, we have to think to gasify the coal. Because coal is very important for us. But word is saying don't use coal. Compromise with the coal. Because coal comes with a lot of emissions. But we have to think, we have to develop those technologies. In those technologies, the coal should become environment friendly. If you gasify the coal, we can reduce the pollution. So basically, by 2030, we have to work on the gasification of coal. So we have to convert the basically coal, the solid fuel into the gaseous fuel. Now, why is there a need for decarbonization of industry in India? Because we talk net zero. By word is saying that you should be net zero by 2050 or 2030. If you remember in Glasgow, in Glasgow, the president of COP 26, they were forcing India to become net zero by 2050 or 2030, 2050. But India didn't agree. Because by 2050, we cannot become net, net zero. Because we don't have that much of you know, foreign reserves to import all the energy from other countries. And those Gulf countries, they were saying that don't use, don't include liquid fuels like petroleum, diesel or crude oil in the fossil fuels. This was very funny in Glasgow, sir. Very funny. How you cannot use, because they are also fossil fuels, but their economic interests are there. Are there. They say, you know, this take out the coal. But when you talk about the fossil fuels, coal is also a fossil fuel and crude oil is also a fossil fuel. But this Gulf country didn't agree because their economic interests are there. So now to decarbonize, Decarbonize means they, 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 they basically you, you stop using coal, but it is not possible for India. You cannot convert, you cannot generate all the energy through renewable energy like solar energy or wind energy because wind energy is available only in coastal areas. And for solar energy generation, you require a lot of land, that area. 
you require and solar energy is not available at night then you have to develop the storage facilities lithium ion this you know many kinds of batteries for the storing of the energy so now the need for the decarbonization decarbonization refers to the process of reducing carbon emission into the atmosphere to limit global warming to below 2 degree above the pre industrialized level now adverse climate effects due to the rise in greenhouse gas emissions and rise in global temperature we all know and this commitment in cop 26 in glasgow in 2021 by india that meet non fossil energy capacity to 50 gigawatt by 2030 sorry this 500 gigawatt by 2030 that 500 gigawatt with solar with biomass with wind energy and meet 50% of the energy requirements till 2030 with the renewable energy and reduce projected carbon emissions by billion by 1 billion tons by 2030 and reduce the carbon intensity of economy by 45% by 2030 and to do this all we have to this basically the goals are to become net zero by 2070 that means whatever carbon you emit into the atmosphere that equal amount of carbon we have to basically store either through you know uh, in the biomass or we have to we have to take back from the atmosphere by direct carbon capture now if you see the possible pathways for india to decarbonize you see this peak reducing you know emission intensity then escalated scenery also implements of india's you know ndcs are uh, this nationally determined contribution and existing and currently announced policies technology advancement then shift in demand of sustainable alternative like electric vehicle so there are many scenery was there in ccus then carbon capture utilization is set in the storage this ccus basically this encompasses methods and technology to remove co2 from the flue gases and from the atmosphere followed by recycling the co2 for utilization and determining safe and permanent storage options despite the adoption of alternative energy sources and energy efficient systems to reduce the rate of co2 emissions the total amount of co2 in the atmosphere needs to be reduced to limit the detrimental or harmful impacts of climate change and this is basically came into the uh, ipcc report now why ccus is important and what is ccus this is a carbon capture utilization and storage is a method of significantly reducing co2 emission to the atmosphere what are the ways to reduce the this you know the co2 emissions ccus technologies can play an important role in meeting net zero targets including as one of the few solutions to tackle emissions from heavy industry to remove carbon from the atmosphere and ccus is considered an important tool to help countries halve their emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050 and these goals are crucial to meet the paris agreement target for restricting global warming to 2 degree and preferable 1.5 degree over pre industrial levels now pre industrial levels you know if we talk about 1750 just you know around 270 270 years ago what was the carbon concentration in the atmosphere can anybody tell in pre pre industrial era when carnot engine was not invented is there anybody from physics background bsc physics honors in 1750 the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere was 280 part per million ppm 280 ppm what is the current concentration in co2 of co2 in the atmosphere if you measure in ppm is around 2020 it was 420 part per million ppm currently co2 concentration in the atmosphere is 420 part per million in 1750 when carnot engine was not invented fossil fuels were not 
used in the machinery in motorized transport or you know in machinery this convert the concentration of co2 in the atmosphere was 280 part per million now it has become so how much increase is there there 33% increase in there is there be read be generally studied in the you know in classes you know in schools 78% is nitrogen 21% is oxygen 0.03 percent is co2 co2 but that we are reading you know in the new in the books they say they think figure should be revised 0.03 means 300 ppm we have, it was 0.28 0.028 so we will just round off 0.03 percent it has become 0.0 not 3.04 2.042 it has become the concentration of co2 into the atmosphere now we all know that co2 is a greenhouse gas why is co2 is a greenhouse gas because the vibrational rotational band of co2 the distance between oxygen and carbon is 18 micron 18 micron and 18 micron or 1818 micrometer is this band comes in the ir region infrared region we receive the radiations from the sun in the short wave and earth emit its radiation in the long wave region so this co2 when this you concentration of co2 in the atmosphere is increasing that means the basically the trapping of the heat ir heat in the atmosphere is increasing and temperature of the earth is increasing now what was the temperature of the earth pre industrial era 1750 some two you know roughly you can say 273 years ago the temperature of the earth was 14 degree celsius now what is the average temperature of the earth currently around the average ten temperature of the earth is 15 degree celsius we run our air conditioners at 25 for com comfortable living that means the god has given us earth as a fully air conditioned if you don't say the like delhi is 48 or too much heat you know everest arctic antarctic minus 60 minus 40 everest you know minus 80 degree celsius himalayas are you know minus 10 Arctic and Antarctic are running in minus. So the average temperature, if you see, if you somebody measure the temperature of the Earth from the space, the whole temperature of the Earth is 15 degrees Celsius. Means the God has given us the Earth as a fully air conditioned. Usse bhi kam temperature. Below than that, we generally use 20 or 25 thermostat in AC. Earth is fully air conditioned, comfort, very comfortable for living. Very, you know, comfortably you can live. But is another thing like in delhi is a 40 degree here is 37 degree you know but arctic antarctic you know greenland on this you know uh poles are you know very cold so average temperature 15 degree celsius now how much changes are you know coming in the in terms of temperature in last you know only in last 100 years the temperature of the earth has increased from 14 to 15.1 1.1 degree temperature in last 100 years has been has increased overall temperature of the earth so if this trend continue if there is no carbon capture there is no you know environmental intervention by the environmentalist then what will hap happen the temperature of the earth can increase 4 degree by the end of this century it can become 19 degree average temperature of the earth and when 19 degree average temperature of the earth that means in delhi what will become in delhi i am just because i live in delhi the june temperature which is reaching 48 degree celsius for 15 days in delhi we have to start summer vacation from march in delhi because march the temperature will shoot 40 and when temperature becomes more than 50 in delhi that means for one month at least there will be complete curfew in delhi nobody can come out you feel that means you can face the sun stroke isn't it lot of heat waves you know how the people you know people may die on the streets if this temperature can increase so 1 degree it looks very small for you very small 
if one degree temperature rises for the earth arctic and antarctic will become 10 20 degree hotter tirchi what is the maximum temperature in tirchi in in june 37 38 temperature can also rise here it can become the mean temperature like in summer from 37 can be shifted to was you know 40 to 43 so one degree global temperature change that means in some places there may be 10 10 degree temperature rise and then the impact on the rainfall monsoon everything crop pattern you know so many things will be you know disturbed with this increase in temperature now we are talking about this CCUS carbon capture utilization in store storage. Now there are two things CCS and CCU. You ca capture the carbon from the industry because then you, you want to decarbonize the industry. This area is very new, I am telling you. And many of I request you to enter this area of CCUS and CCS at least for 2070. This area will be in, in you know limelight because it's a new area. Of carbon capture utilization and storage. You can capture the carbon and you can store the carbon in geological reserves. Or you can, what you can do, you can capture the CO2 from the industry and you convert the CO2 into the plastics, into the fiber, into the soda ash, baking soda, many other products, chemical products, so that you can you can offset the CO2 from the uh, from the you know industry. So this basically carbon capture utilization and storage is a method of significantly reducing CO2 emission into the atmosphere. So you can capture the CO2 and you can basically this store into below, you know, in geological reserves, in saline formations. And you can also at the same time, you can go for the low carbon energy pathways. Now, the role of carbon capture utilization and storage is in climate change mitigation has been a topic of discussion for last 20 years, two decades. And the IPCC also say that global warming of 1.5 degree and the recent, you know, series of announcements made by the nation on net zero have enthused the, basically the, uh, the proponents of this technology, given the potential the technology can play in reducing the, these emissions. But India too has made a commitment to become net zero by 2070 in COP26 in Glasgow. So the basically Honorable Prime Minister announced the pancha minutes to mitigate climate change including achieving net zero by 2070 and consequently various steps including promoting renewable energy, alternative energy sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, reducing emissions from vehicles, adoption of Bharat stress, six norms earlier euro norms or now the world stress six norms increasing green green cover promoting r d adoption of carbon neutral technologies like ccs and ccus have started gaining this basically the prominence in the days to come so co2 capture like they could be post combustion capture they could be pre combustion capture they could be oxy combustion capture they could be direct air capture so many technologies basically are coming up and research is going on now how you can see here the carbon capture utilization and storage uh, see the capture co2 extracted from the natural gas fields factories power plants and this co2 pumped into the underground reservoirs of rock formations and co2 is permanently stored like this and those areas from where the oil has has been extracted, the natural gas has been extracted, and though there is a gap inside the you know the geological formations, so this gap and there is a residue of oil is left inside the earth. You can pump the CO2 from the industry directly, and because of the pressure, there will be enhanced oil recovery. So this enhanced oil recovery can be done, and CO2 completely can be stored in geological formations now the another ccu is coming they capture the co2 from the industry to decarbonize the industry and convert the co2 into the usable usable products chemicals fuels 
like there is one project is coming up in ntpc vindhyachal in a pilot stage what they are doing there are 10 megawatt thermal power plant any generated from the coal in a pilot stage this was commissioned just last year and co2 they are capturing from the plant and they are capturing co2 from the plant and this co2 they are converting into the methanol in the methanol and methanol is a basically useful product like nearby tomorrow i will go to the current one this is one of the oldest you know example of in india if you see the i will show you in the world map tuti corn on the world map no other you know city in india is was the world on the world map for ccus technology for carbon capture utilization and storage this basically plant it you can plant their tfl tuti corn alkali chemicals and fertilizer they are having a or uh, 10 megawatt thermal power plant this a urea plant is there integrated plant they have come up into uh, this plant came up in 2016 as the first project in india of ccus technology they capture the co2 from the thermal power plant and after capturing the co2 they convert co2 into soda ash soda ash is kapde dhone ka powder you know this basically washing soda and this very unique this sir this soda ash is taken by the unilever to make rin to make other you know you know this by by the soap you know manufacturers so there is complete removal of co2 and the complete decarbonization of the industry by converting co2 into the soda ash see here you can see the tuti corn this i was talking around all these global map is tuti corn this you know small dot you see here you know but because our population increasing carbon emissions in india per capita may be low per capita emissions are lowest one of the lowest in the world because we are so much 1.5 billion isn't it 20% population of the world but if you see the total emissions why the world is crying why the world is forcing india to become net zero by 2050 but we didn't agree because we are emitting of so much we are the third emitter of co2 emission in the world after china and usa third emitter of methane if you see currently from the global warming perspective we are the third emitter of greenhouse gases in the world but basically we debate when we debate we debate on the per capita and western world say ki you are so much then what we can do because per capita is very low but if you see total emissions you know we are third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world so they are worried western what is if india doesn't control this co2 emissions then all this paris agreement other you know they cannot be implemented fully but we are having a problem because we we do not have the oil reserves we do not have the <coughs> natural gas reserve that much like european countries are having we are you know dependent for the oil and gas on gulf countries and we cannot all import energy from other countries but we are rich in coal but coal comes with a lot of environmental liabilities people say the coal is not environment friendly so we have to develop the technology or we have to adopt those technologies which can be you know environment friendly which can capture the carbon so that coal can be utilized in a sustainable way for india so if you see the these basically current what is the current status of ccus in the world if you see the, they like a large scale facilities of carbon capture and storage red then large scale you know carbon capture and storage facilities in advanced development and large scale ccs facilities is completed but these are the small you know this pilot and demonstration scale facility completed this in tuti corn first time it was completed in 2016 by ccsl carbon clean uh the companies there the companies there so that carbon clean uh basically this uh, uh company basically is uh, uh has uh, prepared this plant to, to function this with you know 100% co2 capture and 
converting CO2 in the useful uh, materials. Now, you see this CCUS contribution to CO2 emission reduction by sector up to the 2070. Iron is still 25% around cement also, cement industry because a lot of construction will be going on and chemicals, then fuel transformation, then power generation. Then comes what are the applications of CCUS? Carbon capture and utilization and storage. Mitigating climate change despite the adoption of alternative energy sources and energy efficient system to reduce the rate of CO2 emissions. The total cumulative amount of CO2 in the atmosphere needs to be reduced to limit the harmful impact, detrimental impacts of climate change. And industrial use, combining CO2 with the steel slag, an industrial byproduct of the steel manufacturing process to make construction materials compatible with the Paris Agreement goals. And enhanced UR, enhanced oil recovery, CCUS is already making inroads into the India also. For instance, oil and ONGC signed up MOU with Indian Oil Corporation IOCL for enhanced oil recovery by injecting CO2. Those fields which are where you know the basically the reserve of oil and gas are not fully exploited. And if you inject CO2, then with pressure, those you know leftover oil and gas can come out and CO2 will be stored permanently because that gap when you extracted oil and gas from the earth from the rock formations, that gap void can be filled with the CO2 and CO2 can be permanently stored as a geological reserve. So that technique is known as enhanced oil recovery. It is only implemented in many countries. In India also, it has been implemented. So now CO2 capture, CO2 source, there will be anaerobic digestion, industry, air capture, power regeneration. Now, how this CO2 can be captured? What could be the sustainable pathway for CO2 capture, storage, and utilization of CO2? It can be directly stored into the earth, in the ground, in the geological formation, in saline formations, where water is not sweet, water is not fresh. Saline water is there, which is unfit for drinking purposes. That saline formation can be used for storage, for injecting of CO2 when you capture the CO2 from the industries. And utilize this, this is a very promising area, utilization of CO2, transformation of CO2, direct use, like you can convert CO2 into solvent, you can convert you know, food or you can use in enhanced oil recovery. In those depleted fields, you can inject the CO2. Then biologically, like convert into fuels, bio oils and chemicals, and chemicals you can convert into the fuels, bulk chemicals, plastics, minerals, and fine chemicals like one example I gave you is soda ash and methanol like NTPC is basically the new project if you log on the Google you know CO2 converted to methanol by NTPC Bindyachal. you can find how this technology is evolving so now many there are many CCUS technologies like direct you can do the direct air capture then you can do the, the oxyfuel combustion, then post combustion and pre combustion capture. And in post combustion capture, there are many other techniques. I will not go into the technical details. Then you see here, you can understand this carbon capture technology post combustion. Basically, post combustion, the tutic and power plant is using the post combustion carbon capture technology. And my project scope, SCOP, is also post combustion carbon capture. And what are the environmental impacts of this? will be of post combustion carbon capture technologies we are studying in this project. So post combustion like you see, you burn the fuel, suppose coal, you make a powder of the coal and in fuel eyes, you know, bad combustion, you combust the, uh, the, the coal and you generate power in boiler. Now this flue gases, flue gases basically when you burn the coal, the gases comes out like a smoke. There is CO2, there is carbon monoxide, there is NOx, there is SOx, there is particulate matters, there is ammonia in this in the flue gases. So you capture this basically 
you capture the co2 because we are concerned or the co2 as a greenhouse gas to decarbonize the industry this co2 15% co2 which vary from 3 to 50% is a fuel gas or uh, this flue gas uh, when you go for post combustion by coal this 15% co2 is captured and this co2 is captured and nitrogen is emitted into the atmosphere through you know stack emissions and this co2 is captured and co2 is converted into the useful products so there is a complete you know diversion of co2 uh, from the atmosphere so now you can say the industry is decarbonized then another pre combustion any pre combustion you you basically uh, you supplement the air and supplement the oxygen then you gasify the fuel like gasify the fuel example like coal you coal you don't burn the coal as a solid fuel you gasify the fuel at a particular temperature and all the elements of coal like ch and so they are liberated and there comes a you know this synthetic gas syn gas and in this syn gas co2 is almost 40% which is very high and this hydrogen so co2 you remove you capture the co2 and then h2 and air and h2 is very high rich in energy so this h2 and air burn and you run the turbine and co2 we capture so you decarbonize the industry then oxy combustion you separate this nitrogen from the fuel and this mix the oxygen with the fuel and you generate power and you capture the co2 now this basically this is a post combustion carbon capture my project basically is on this post combustion carbon capture and it's very interesting see how this this is a absorber this column is absorber what do you do you basically like you have a power plant for power plant you are burning coal flue gases are coming and you all these flue gases basically you are feeding in this column co2 is also there in flue gases and in this in this column basically you are circulating amine solvent amine amine solvent you are circulating like this in this plant you know to decorin they are using cdr max solvent of amines so what the amines property of amines is there this co2 is absorbed by the amines and all other gases are taken out from the stacks and this amine rich co2 rich amine because co2 is you know they bond in co2 and amines you google and study this reaction with amines and co2 co2 is absorbed by the amines so this rich amine basically is circulated in the strip striper what the striper will do in the striper you heat the this amines CO2 rich amines or rich amine, then CO2 will be liberated. Then CO2 will be liberated and amine will be again available for recirculation. So again, you this reboiler amines are coming and whatever the left CO2 is there again it's liberated and CO2 is captured here. CO2 is captured here and amine is ready for recirculation. So this amine lean amine lean amine means. lean pump lean amine means the amine is completely you know without co2 rich amine amine with co2 so this lean amine again coming to the absorber and this ready to for the circulation but what happens over the time like when you are circulating this amine for 4 months 6 months 10 months there will be degradation in amine because you have to top up like when you use your air conditioner you use the gases in air conditioner now what happens after one year two year when you buy new ac the gases are leaked or gases are degraded then you to require top up isn't it so that now amines are harmful for the environment because amines there you know this total environmental impact of amine is not still completely studied and this we are basically studying the environmental impacts of amine if you 
नोट डाउन दी वेबसाइट डब्ल्यू 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 स्कोप डैश एक्ट ए सी टी डॉट ओ आर जी एंड यू गो पब्लिकेशन यू विल फाइंड एन सी गुप्ता देर पब्लिकेशन सो बी है डब्ल्यू 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 डॉट ए सीओ पी स्कोप डॉट डैश एक्ट ए सी टी एक्सक्लेटिंग कार्बन टेक्नोलॉजी एक्ट इज एक्सक्लेटिंग कार्बन टेक्नोलॉजी डॉट ओ आर जी You will find the scope website by are maintained by the RCN Research Council of Norway. So what we are basically this in this project we are studying the environmental impacts. There is there is basically work packages five WP one WP two three four five WP three work package three which is basically I am handling with Imperial College London is basically to what will the environmental impacts because these all plants in pilot stage. When we talk about TRL technology readiness level. This technology is already TRL nine. When it is went to eleven, the technology is commercialized. That means it can be used on a large scale by the industry. But this technology, basically, generally, this technology, amine-based carbon capture, is in pilot scale. These environmental impacts fully addressed, then this technology will be completely commercialized because carbon capture capture in by this technology is almost ninety five percent more than that. But we have to study the these environmental impacts are not fully studied. Many you know countries have many research labs have studied them, but I think within one or two three years I think this technology will become commercialized. So this this technology is I mean based carbon capture. Now columns and packs, thirty fifty percent capex and solvent flow rate opex. Now what the capex and this will basically in economics because this conference is. The environmental, sustainable environment and economy. So basically, this is a capital expenditure. Now, कितना खर, how much money will be required to implement this technology? So this capital expenditure and operating expenditure. Technology when you are running this plant, cap around thirty fifty percent. You know the basically expenditure will be on the capital of. You know, raising, erecting these all equipments, and only this solvent flow rate. This I mean, because I mean, you have to top up after two months, three months. You know, to 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 make over. You know, this I mean, uh, will require only ten, five to ten percent opex operating expenditure or operating co cost of this technology, and this regeneration heat because the reboiler is there. Again, when I mean coming, you have to re-oil it, and whatever CO two is left is also liberated and will come as in this CO two product gas, and this lean I mean will be available available for recirculation, like in steam generation, steam raising. You use you know DM water, in steam you for steam you have to DM DM water DM mineralized water, and that water which you use in steam. Is ten thousand rupees per liter. Can you, which is used in a, you know, close boiler tube, that water, the completely deep. Otherwise, there will be corrosion in the boiler tubes. So similarly, this amine will be ready for circulation. Uh, but you have to, uh, basically the top of the, you know, these amines or you know, uh, uh, after some time when there is some degradation is there in the amine solvents. So this. Carbon utilization, like if you see the fossil fuels, biomass, direct air capture, industrial processes, underground deposits, and CO two conversion and non conversion, how the CO two can be used? Now the new technology coming, how this CO two can be captured? How this CO two can be used in other products? You can make fuels, you can make methanol, you can make gasoline, diesel, aviation fuels from by conversion, chemicals, different different chemicals you can make from the CO two. You can make the building materials also, and you can make this like a. You can you can use this CO two for you know you have a greenhouse where you grow the plants. You can inject this CO two in the greenhouse, so there will be more you know this as if it's it will be available as a food for the plants. Around CO two, then you can you know grow algae. You can make urea fertilizer, and you can use as a enhance oil recovery as I discussed. And you can use in CO two for dry cleaning. You can use in refrigeration, supercritical power system, other food and beverages. You know, you know, we call it aerated drinks, Coca Cola, Pepsi, 
Campagola, when you, you know, open the bottles, you know, immediately gas comes out from the thumbs up, from the Coca Cola. What is that gas? That is CO2. That is CO2. You know, in aerated drinks, aerated drinks, but that is CO2 is there inside. So you can use in beverages also this CO2, and you can completely divert the CO2. Then. You can see here the carbon storage. You can direct it. from the industry. You can go for the geological storage. You can this. You can inject the CO2 from the industry, and you can produce the oil because of this pressure. This oil will come out. So you can increase. You can enhance the you know production of oil wells, and you can store the CO2 in saline reservoir where water is not sweet. Or water you cannot drink because it is saline water, or there is a depleted oil or gas reservoir. Those reservoirs, those oil fields, those gas fields where oil and gas is already extracted, and there is vacuum, there is a void. You can inject CO2, and you CO2 can be permanently can be stored in those geological formations. So now, what are the environmental benefits? Risks and public perception related to CO2 uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So there is the major environmental benefits of CCUS to world is its potential to reduce atmospheric levels of CO2 while fossil fuels continue to be used to fuel the world's energy consumption. And CCUS is the primary technology to meet global decarbonization and net zero goals, as this can contribute 24 percent of the cumulative emissions reductions. So we see here for India. That means we can continue, India, we can continue with the fossil fuels. As I told you, for us, black is beautiful because we are having a 105 billion tons of coal reserves, third largest in the world after Russia and China. 105 billion. That means this coal, the, with the current, you know, with the current efficiency of thermal power plants, with current utilization, at least 120 years we can sustain with the coal and by the that time our this renewable energy you know cost can come down and we can in this time we can switch over to the renewable energy also but how we can sustain with the coals because we have to decarbonize coal all co2 which will be emitted from the co from the you know from the coal has to be captured and we have to decarbonize industry. That means we have to go for net zero industry only then. But beauty is that we can continue with this coal utilization without any heat. We can continue. But the condition is that we have to capture CO2. So now what are the risks associated? Because you can divert the CO2 into the depleted oil reserves, geological storage. but some geologists say, some scientists say there could be, you know, slowly, slowly there could be leakage from this those reservoirs over the time. How will cap those leakages? Again, CO2 will come into the atmosphere. So that we have to see those rocks which are having a permanent cap rocks, isn't it? CO2 should not come out from those cracks. Abrupt CO2 leakage. And this, you know, this is a and people say that is a high cost of implementation to inject CO2 in the depleted oil reservoirs in saline formation. There is a lot of cost of CO2, you know, sequestration. CO2 sequestration is a lot of cost. It comes with a lot of cost. This is it. Now, this is amine solvent emissions. It to the current plant is basically doing. Or this, you know, carbon capture and utilization. See, this emissions of, what is the problem in this emissions of amines and NOx? In this technology, when you use amine to absorb CO2 and you go to the striper, you again separate CO2 from the amines. That can emit amines, you know, byproducts. So amine byproducts, they basically form nitramines and nitrosamines. And the photolysis of the nitrosamines and the formation of harmful products. 
and this has this for this technology these harmful products have to be tackled completely to make this technology safe now what is the public perception of the ccs technology if you see here this entire ccs process should be safe we are also working on the public perception in this project what how the public thinks and independent oversight and regulation clear benefits for local communities should be there and meaningful local engagement in this technology and minimize disruption to local residents when you using this technology in large scale carbon capture plants there may be emissions of nitro amines nitro amines amines you know derivatives then you want to shift the villages from there or they are exposed to higher concentration of nitro amines nitro amines these are harmful so that has to be tackled and can this technology guarantee for net zero now cost effective and timely this should be economy of the technology it should be affordable it should be cost effective not so costly then one of the several measures to reaching net zero and limit damage to wildlife and natural environment what will be the what will be the impact of this technology on wildlife and environment that is important we have to we have to address this issue of to limit damage to wildlife and natural environment and transparency in funding and awarding of contracts when you implant implement these ccs technologies then government efforts to develop ccs in india we are already working we are going renewable energy can be used to for the hydrogen production and then this can, hydrogen production can be used for new you know catalyst technology new process technology and energy saving techniques and chemical raw materials like i am giving example this renewable energy from renewable energy you are making hydrogen and you use amine based carbon capture co2 co2 plus hydrogen you can convert it this into methanol like ntpc vindachal is doing they are generating hydrogen plant co2 they are capturing and the co2 and s2 they are converting this co2 into the methanol so now you can make polycarbonate co2 you know carbon what is the polycarbonate you know transparent seeds like you window you use the glass window you can make a fiber transparent fiber with co2 like those you know white windows you see those you can replace the glass you can use use co2 and you can make this polycarbonate and polycarbonate you can use in car glass windows car window glass window you can replace with the polycarbonate windows and they are transparent so you can divert the co2 and you can make the other products also now what are the government of india's efforts to develop ccs we have to set net zero targets individual stakeholders of the upstream now this value chain may be asked to set their individual net zero targets and road maps with a definition timeline and this is inclusion of ccs in national climate action plan then you know this create amenable conditions for investment provide financial support for the feasibility study for early movers establish and propagate carbon markets and provide tax benefits for the equipment owners who want to implement this ccs technology and provide the viability gap funding for commercial projects at concessional rates and encourage procurement of lower emission products and reinforce public awareness and enhance their participation in this process so it is important that the general public is made aware of the benefits and risk associated with the carbon capture utilization and storage technologies and set up a robust and transparent support system successful and effective deployment of ccs and ccs technologies require they require the presence of independent regulatory mechanism 
with clearly defined roles and responsibility for the industry. And the, you have to provide the funding, support, capital, and operating costs for early projects. Grant funding programs can play a key role in supporting early CCUS uh, adoption. And this may not only provide the necessary knowledge and experience, but also help in alleviating the high capital cost and commercial and technical risks, which are associated with the technology, this CCUS technology. And develop a geological CO2 storage atlas for a country. Like for a country, you have to find out on geological map, where are the saline formations, where are the depleted oil reserves, where the CO2 can be injected, CO2 can be stored permanently. Those areas we have to find out on the atlas and develop and adopt norms for transparent and effective reporting, monitoring and verification. Monitoring is very important. If the CO2 is completely stored, geological formations, is there any leakage or is it permanently stored or not? So that has to be verification has to be made. So rules and standard mechanisms to report, monitor and verify the reduction in CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions should be set up. Then action by Indian industries. Many Indian industries are participating in this CCUS technology. They have adopted this CCUS technology. We will give the example. We will see public sector like NALCO, ONGC. Now it's a private sector. BHEL are taking up this carbon capture and storage projects. And NALCO has commissioned a pilot come demonstration CO2 capture to Christensen plant. And ONGC has signed a memorandum of understanding with you know, ILFS in Energy in Tamil Nadu Power uh, Company Limited in 2018 to inject CO2 capture in power plant and field oil fields of discovery, you know, basin. And ONGC and Indian Oil signed the MOU with CO2 based enhanced oil recovery by injecting CO2 in this coily refinery, IOC, I think it's in South India, this coily refinery. And these efforts are there to reduce India's carbon emission targets set forth in 20, COP 20, 21, basically in Glasgow it was held. And the ONGC's enhanced oil recovery project has its sequestration potential around 5 to 8 million metric tons of CO2 through structural solubility and residual trapping mechanism. And this, you know, additionally private players like Dalmia Cements, Leading cement uh, uh, manufacturing companies also adopting CCUS uh, for their carbon capture and changing narrative towards the prospects of implementing CCS, CCUS technology across the globe, including India, are evident, primary, primary driven by climate change mitigation ambitions. And India, however, this technology is far from becoming mainstream, but the government of India and Indian industries are trying better to understand this techno-economic feasibility and scalability of this technology. Because techno-economic feasibility is very important. Technology should be cost-effective so that industry can easily adopt this technology to implement. Now, if you see here, uh, CCUS and related industrial implements in India, see this. 1988, 150 tons per day of CO2 capture. 150 tons of CO2. This Indo Rama India Jagdishpur plant, you know, this is basically a urea manufacturing plant, and this using this technology, and this basically the product is urea. Ifco Fulpur UP is also using this technology. And you see this technology like solvency, Vishnu, you know, barium in Andhra Pradesh using CCSL. They basically carbon clean solutions limited this CDR max they are using in-house project and this TAC duty corn see it, this duty corn alkali chemical you know uh, fertilizer limited TAC this is using this technology uh, this TAC duty corn in they are using this solution CDR max and what is CDR max CDR basic max is a amine solvent is a amine solvent which basically absorbs the CO2. And you, when you heat the amine, CO2 is liberated in stiper and CO2 can be captured. So they are basically using 174 tons per day. And this comes around 60,000 tons per year. 
this you know tutic or alkali fertilizer are using this technology and this basically they are making a this sodium bicarbonate and sodium carbonate and simply you to see, see this this technology cdr max is also used in this bishnu chemicals and recently this ntpc and and ntpc vindhyachal this and in madhya pradesh basically is this super you know a thermal power station this using this technology with cdr max and they are basically making a green methanol See, very interesting this they are making a green methy methanol they are basically producing the hydrogen plant they are having a, and this technology they are using co2 co2 with hydrogen they are converting into the methanol green methanol because co2 is completely captured and industry decarbonized and this other iocl panipat plant is basically you know this praj industries 2g ethanol they are bioethanol they are making and there was this praj industry was in news because in punjab and haryana farmers burn this biomass and there was a concept that use this biomass to generate power and capture this co2 and capture this co2 and convert this co2 into the this green methanol this this bioethanol so bioethanol means this basically coming from the biomass so biomass is converted into the ethanol so this basically our uh, technology now if you see here this like a ifco plant in fulpur they are capturing co2 they are this plant is capturing co2 kakinada plant in andhra pradesh is capturing co2 and this tutic or an alkali fertilizer chem chemicals plant this is 10 megawatt as i discussed you and this 10 megawatt co2 is captured and this co2 is basically as 174 tons per day co2 is captured in this plant and this chemical is completely converted into the this co2 is completely converted into the chemical known as soda ash and co2 is completely diverted in the products so this very this having a around you know uh, 60000 tons per annum capacity or but this is you know carbon clean solutions limited basically company a company has basically introduced this carbon capture facility carbon capture technology in tutic or alkali power plants so now government of india basically is this you know center of excellence on carbon capture utilization and storage if you see iit madras is working on ccus iit madras with ccus lab and energy consortium is having an iit madras and like nit warangal is also working on ccus and all calcium carbon grouping and you see this here industrial r&d is being carried out by pilot study in a few company like rel you know reliance industry limited is basically working on carbon capture utilization and storage and iocl and like this is very recent developments you know niti aayog the national level of works on carbon capture utilization and storage if you log on on the niti aayog you see the niti aayog report niti aayog report on ccus you log in you will find the dastur and company has carried out a you know very big uh, you know study on this it's around a 168 pages report uh, and published in 2021 recently uh, it was funded by the niti aayog then you see here this act called by accelerating carbon technology recently 12 september you know 2020 was last year to apply and this 2020 act you know this accelerated carbon technologies carbon capture technology 2020 in this project this was a research council of norway project 3.7 million euro is around roughly 37 crores 37 crores in this project i participated in ccus if you log on the google guru gobind singh in the pasta university iit khadakpur and microfield india limited you just log on the you know google scope scop you will find this project two projects were funded from india by research council of norway in 2020 when we participated in this act this is excluding carbon technology the calls comes from norway the calls coming act 1 in 2010 then act 2 act 3 act 4 also come and act 3 india participated two two projects were given iit bombay sarp storage iit gsip university and this scope their amine based carbon capture 
and this iit bombay basically this there are geological storage of carbon uh, carbon utilization storage so i participated in this project and in this project the basically scope project the ip university in iit kharagpur budget was 2.08 crores 2.08 crores to spend in 3 years and is but it called through dst so now this summary basically to disk in all in order to achieve the goals of the paris agreement transition to a low carbon economy is necessary to combat the climate change and technological innovations is one of the ways to achieve this therefore ccs technology can be used as one pioneering technology to bridge the gap and the key goal of the ccs is to achieve environmental benefits by removing large quantity of co2 from the atmosphere and sustainable approach is needed to look beyond the future and identify key risks and mitigate the challenges identify as a you know feasible use of ccs technology so this basically with this you know i discuss issues that ccs technology the impacts environmental risks friends we think that we are the custodian of this mother earth we think we are the guardian of this mother earth but certainly we are not we are simply a one species out of a millions of species on this earth and that is homo sapiens we think we are the guardian we are the custodian we are the, we should remember after covid 19 as we must remember if we are only one species on this earth isn't it and then we think we have taken a contract for this to for this mother earth we are just like a single one species isn't it and 2019 covid has taught us people are thinking that this species will be extinct from the earth <laughs> so as you know the vice chancellor of this you know morning session you were talking about the triple bottom line i should repeat triple bottom line we have planet we have economic economy or you know as prosperity planet economy or oblique prosperity and we have people us this is important the first is planet then is people and prosperity is in last isn't it when people will be there a planet will be then only prosperity will be there isn't it so we should not you know do anything on the cost of planet on the cost of environmental degradation so with this all i uh, i will conclude conclude my talk here and i must thank the bishop haber college the principal and particularly sri ravi chandran he is my old friend you know i think you might not be knowing knowing him for the last i think 33 years you know old friendship is revived revisited in this campus isn't it so i must thank especially dr vanu she was you know contacting me you know reminding me for the lecture writing me the mails messages ke you have to come on this you know lecture give a brief sir so thank you very much thank you all thank you the students for listening this you know i i think i think you must be you know little bit wiser after seeing this you know uh, on this uh, seeing the lecture on this carbon carbon capture utilization storage and i must request you all those particularly who are in msc final year they must also take this project for their msc dissertation if they are go and they must work because these technology are very promising and they will take you the ahead of the time like re renewable energy and these you know ccs technology the future is there in in their these technologies so with this all i conclude my talk thank you very much thank you so much thank you sir for giving us knowledge about carbon capture utilization and storage and insights about maintaining carbon neutrality the session is open for discussion participants yes. please make use of it any question anybody wants to ask i think i would try to answer
professor gupta i have few questions yeah sure uh, you said uh, first one is the india uh, the indian technology is uh, the the first i think uh, one of the the previous slides yes uh, 55% more we are emitting that uh, when compared to is it due to technology or the quality of coal is different see ah uh, yes i uh, i think i should i go back to the slide yes 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 very good question you have asked i think lot of you know hidden informations are there in that uh i think there was a table first hmm? yeah yeah no table i think is back uh, yes yes coming to that yes this, uh, this one this one yeah very good question see here for one unit of electricity one kilowatt hour electric generation we emit india emit 771.3 gram of means you say 0.77 you can say roughly 0.8 kilogram 0.77 kilogram am i right kilogram of co2 per kilowatt hour of electricity and this is 52% higher of the global average see our coal we are having a 105 billion tons of coal reserves in india as third largest in the world but our the quality of coal we have generally sub bituminous coal anthracite we import quality of coal is not very good the basically the energy value of the coal is not much we are having a 35 to 40% of flyers in coal second thing is that our one our you know the efficiency of the thermal power plant is not good is they are running i think around 35% of it if you see if you remove if you, you don't take into account some super you know critical thermal power plant our efficiency is very low so we have to improve our efficiency because of efficiency is low so per capita or sorry per per kilowatt hour or per unit of energy generation we are emitting higher now if you see the usa usa particularly if you see the european union only they are half of ours you know 314 you know means 300 grams around co2 they are emitting per kilowatt hour of power generation so their efficiency is very high so we have to you know uh, for some power plant we mix other coal also good quality coal to run our boilers so this basically poor quality of coal and at the same time it there is a lower efficiency because you require money to replace the technology isn't it so old old power plants which are you know old old they are using old technology they have to be replaced with newer technology to reduce the emission of co2 per unit of power generation yes okay next one is uh, you said the tac yeah two uh, tukdi two tricorin alkali chemicals yes yes, yes. Uh, they are using uh, these amines yeah for converting into soda as bicarbonate right right, right. uh uh the thing is uh, i would like to know the cost and benefit uh, suppose they are spending money for it yes yes they have to spend as you said installation cost and running cost and everything yes and they are producing uh, that bicarbonate and they are selling it to companies like uh, yes, yes. Uh, hindustan liver and other yes. companies so uh, the cost of production of soda as and uh, is it they are compensating or expensive see technology currently as i told you the power plant basically to the current 10 megawatt 10 megawatt means very small plant is a captive power plant and is a pilot plant similarly you know this around 10 megawatt is also coming up has already started in bindachal by ntpc and they are converting they are making a green methanol they are making a soda ash is a pilot plant you know okay. cost study you know if of course the basically the the cost is higher but because as i told you the government should promote you know these green technologies by giving subsidies or because by you know carbon capture basically they are doing that carbon you know basically capture they are doing that has to be sold in the carbon market because they should be compensated for that then i think technology can be you know most cost effective and more feasible in future 
and i have one simple question that uh, when we convert them into methanol again we are burning the methanol again we are emitting carbon dioxide of course <laughs> then, then again we have to capture, <laughs> have to capture <laughs> <it>. co2 <laughs> basically point is right but i think we have to make it for circular economy isn't it yes, yes. even like somebody asked me a question even i am solar energy is not carbon free for solar energy you have to make panels you have to make photovoltaic panels for panels you used to steel you have to use the solar cells and solar to make the steel to solar cells you have to use coal you have to use steel you have to refine iron ore so there co2 emissions isn't it yes. but we talk about the net co2 emission net how much we have to reduce or how much we have reduced basically in the over the complete cycle that has to be thought yeah, even we you know celebrate the birthday we burn the candle we emit co2 you that's inaugurate true. any function you lighting of the lamp you emit co2 <laughs> <laughs> that is true so any questions from the audience yes please gas emission cost reduces see very good question you have actually you are asking a future generation question future you know sit down you know when you talk about the fuel there are three kinds of fuel one is the solid fuel liquid fuel and gases fuel when you when you go in your kitchen 100 years ago what people using in kitchen solid fuel biomass coal in angiti isn't it solid fuel we switch from solid fuel to kerosene cook stoves liquid fuel some 30 years ago then we came to the lpg lpg replaced by the png piped natural gas in houses i think tirchi also png in houses lpg lpg the delhi there are pipe natural gas meter is there like water you know meter is there will is coming and they pipe natural gas i am asking question to gasification of coal you know te this technology is this fuel is very much friendly with the technology this fuel solid fuel liquid fuel or gaseous fuel this fuel is very friendly with the technology with comfort gaseous fuel in kitchen you can control by regulator you can control by knob you can flow you can control isn't it solid fuel solid fuel is not very you know not friendly with the automation liquid fuel you can supply through pipelines gases fuel by pipelines very comfort no leakages handling is very easy now when you talk about the coal currently earlier we were using coal as a solid fuel this is a boiler may if you see the old trains running now steam engines are completely removed if you sub you know, old movie chal chaiya chaiya or oh, you can see the movie in the you know saro khan is dancing on the you know on the roof of the train isn't it that is a you know powered by solid fuel coal then diesel engines came isn't it then trains are being replaced by the electric isn't it it doesn't mean electric electricity also comes by burning of coal other fuels but when you use solid earlier solid fuels while you use coal by use as a solid fuel in boilers then there there came you know fluidized gas or uh, fluidized bed you make a powder of coal you make a powder now coal is not used in industry as a solid fuel is powdered and powder powdered is sprayed with you know id fan induced fan air in the air and coal burn in the air so that each each and every particle of coal is burned for higher efficiency if it is a solid fuel then in core coal will not burn the black carbon will remain efficiency will be low coal is coal is i have tell you black is beautiful it's very important fuel for us we cannot waste it we power powder it then we burn in the boiler where is where when it is sprayed in the is known as a fluidized bed coal is not solid you see it has become fluid sprayed like a powder now the technology is coming to gasify the coal don't use as a powder now you gasify the coal because coal is a mixture coal is basically is a constituent of coals are c h n 
S and O. If you do the S analysis of coal in CHNO so analyzer, you will find these are elements of coal. And what are the elements of natural gas? CHNO. Elements of gases fuel are this. So basically, both are fossil fuels. So you gasify the coal, convert into the gas. Now, when you convert the gasify the coal, convert into gas, the handling will be easy. Each and everything will be burnt, isn't it? Efficiency will increase. And when you, you know, gasify the coal, many impurities you can remove from the gaseous fuel. And it will become more friendly, more friendly with the automation. And at the same time, more efficiency, more efficient, efficient fuel, isn't it? And you can control it. So, and wastage you can re uh, remove, pollution you can remove, and you can make it very friendly fuel, like a gaseous fuel. So, then you can also save on the carbon emissions also. I think uh, you got it. Yes. Anybody else? Any girl, I think many girls are there, nobody is asking anything. Ask anything, you know, any question. Don't think your question is not good or bad, isn't it? Every question is right. <laughs> You want to ask something? You want to ask something? No. Thank you, sir. Now I request the delegates and participants to break for lunch and come back to the same hall at 2.15 p.m. This I think I need to remove. Huh? Thank you, sir. Very good. Uh -huh. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Very tight. Lunch is served outside the hall. Kindly help yourselves and have a happy lunch. Thank you. Technical sessions will commence at 2.15 p.m. The sessions will happen parallelly in the same hall and the seminar hall. Please verify your venue at the registration desk. Thank you.
கிளாஸ் பண்ண என்னங்களா தெரியுதா பாட்டு படிக்கிறது ஸ்பீச் கிராமரா ஜெய் ஹரிஹரன் ஐ வெல்கம் யூ அவங்க இருக்கிறார்
Participants kindly occupy the front seats. Mr. Safi Udin, come to the MC desk. Denison sir is calling you. Denison sir. Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. Hello, hello. Mommy, sound it. Hello, hello. Check. Hello, sir. Hello, check. Wanna come now? Hello. Check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check. Check, check.
வளரப்போகுது நான் சவுண்ட் வைக்கல சார் சார் இத தூக்கி பிக்ஸ் பண்றதுக்குள்ள டைம் போயிடும் சார் டவுன்லோட் பண்ணிக்கிறேன் இருந்தாலும் டங்கன் அடிச்சா ஜாலியா இருக்கும் சார் நீ வந்துட்டு நான் ஒரு
Good afternoon to my and I. The technical question is about the question. Can you tell me about the question? <laughs> your thoughts are the architect of your destiny a very good afternoon to one and all gathered here we welcome you all to the first technical session of the day on biodiversity and conservation environmental education green technology and sustainable industrialization and remote sensing it's our immense pleasure to welcome you all to this session now i invite dr d uday banu assistant professor department of environmental sciences to honor our chairperson dr prisla suresh with a memento as a token of our gratitude ma'am is an eminent person who has wholeheartedly participated and worked on more than 44 national and international conferences besides ma'am has published her works in eight journals and two books she has also actively participated in international and national level training programs we are indeed very happy to welcome you ma'am thank you ma'am now i invite dr r tennyson to honor our reporter dr jeremia kirbanand with a memento as a token of gratitude sir is a notable person who has actively involved himself in more than 27 state national and international level conferences we are absolutely delighted to welcome you sir thank you sir now i hand over the session to the chairperson and the reporter Good afternoon, everyone. I am extremely happy to be a part of this uh, international conference on environmental uh, sustainability and uh, economy uh, towards transforming the world by 2030. So I have attended the inauguration program. It was really uh, wonderful to uh, see many uh, scholars uh, who has who have come uh, from Delhi and uh, uh, and we see from Manan uh, Muniyam uh, Sundara, sorry, uh, Periyar Maniyam uh, University, and uh, many other scholars said to uh, give their uh, 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 their experience and as their and the insights in the subject in the coming uh, sessions. So today uh, I'm uh, um, I'm very much glad uh, because. Uh, Uday Banu, the organizing secretary of this conference, and uh, Dr. Ravichandran sir, who has uh, invited me uh, for this uh, uh, technical session, uh, the test paper presentation section, uh, uh, to me. And uh, I'm really glad to be uh, in this program. And as well as uh, uh, we are also involved in many activities in the in environmental science sciences especially uh, uh, in the academics as well as in other uh, extracurricular activities co-curricular activities uh, and other programs and all uh, they are they usually involve us also so it is a great thing uh, uh, to be uh, as, uh, closely associated with the environmental sciences department uh, thank you uh, thank you very much thank you ma'am I'm going 
Now, I call upon the first presenter, Sasi Darin, to present the paper on the title Impact of Land Use and Land Cover Changes on the Migration of Wetland Birds.
Marcel. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sasidharan from Department of Environmental Science and Management, Baradasan University. My topic is impact of land use and land cover changes on wet migration of wetland birds. Introduction: the migration, the migratory birds of the the migration of birds depends on the seasonality of food resource. It takes place in months with a round trip to the resting areas and return to the terrest terresting of nesting. Uh, respectively, uh, migratory birds are seasonal guests with uh, positive impacts. Population of migratory birds is for Population of migratory birds is fast declining due to uh, to danger poses to their survival by a host of factors such as lack of nesting uh, sites due to more modern uh, articulture, arti architecture of uh, architecture of buildings lack lack of seeds insects. The aim of this paper is to assess the present status of the migratory birds in different seasons and to investigate the possible cause for the decline of migratory birds uh, to ident uh, objective uh, to identify the population of migratory birds to, uh, to identify the changes in population to analyze the relation between birds and land use and land cover changes to use remote sensing to assess importance of vegetation vegetational change on birds migration my study area is Karavati Bird Sanctuary, Vadur uh, Bird Sanctuary, and uh, Point Kalima Bird Sanctuary, Wildlife Sanctuary. Methodology uh, It is uh, done by point count method by uh, separating the lakes in uh, five points or something, and by standing in a specific space for uh, five to ten minutes, uh, the count is taken uh, using remote sensing and GIS tools, image processing methods such as L land cover and land use changes and vegetational change using NDVI is done on a Landsat images on seasonal pattern, ground truthing and statistical analysis to use estimate the factor responsible for the changing uh, migratory population and decline of. Uh, it is the Vadu data of 21, uh, 2021 to 22 and current data is in process and uh, we need a uh, previous data also. So the study is still carried, uh, in process. Uh, in uh, Vadur, uh, the comparing with 21, uh, there is a decline in flamingo uh, and uh, great cormorant, and there is a drastic uh, decline in uh, little grip and in purple moorhead. Uh, in Karaveti bird sanctuary, uh, there is a Increase in uh, arrival of uh, bar-headed goose, and uh, the there is a very drastic uh, decline in Eurasian coot. As such, in Point Kalima, uh, comparing to 21's, uh, 22's data, there are totally 22 lakhs something species uh, population of birds has arrived, and uh, 77 species. But uh, according to this year's data, there are 97 species. Uh, Around has arrived, but the population has been declined to 40,000 some, around 40,000. Uh, the lake of uh, Vadu, uh, the increase in uh, vegetation and the uh, land cover uh, surrounded by it or uh, agricultural uh, use. So there is a, a decline. It is a cause for a temperature rise and it uh, is the decline uh, and it is a it causes some uh, decline in migratory birds and uh, it also affects the resident birds also. Comparing to the 2021s, there is some uh, 
change in the lakes uh, surroundings as the vegetation has grown, the water body has uh, decreased. As in Karevetti, uh, the vegetation cover is also increased, uh, increased uh, and in increased uh, comparing to 21 and 22. Conclusion, uh, land use and uh, land cover of the water body has changed due to vegetation uh, encounter and increase in land for agricultural activities. Birds visit have declined due to anthropogenic disturbance, uh, poor water quality and reduced vegetation. The population shift is significantly uh, impacted by land use and land cover changes. Climate in a specific location is shifting with is the result of land use and land cover change. Thank you. Thank you. Well then, uh, you have done uh, uh, the uh, survey of migratory birds in three different regions. Uh, Karaveti and uh, Vadur uh, and, uh, uh, and Point Kalimar. And you have said uh, there is a decline in uh, flamingo like that. Then uh, what are the possible reasons uh, for, uh, uh, for the declining? You have said the vegetation. Uh, Actually, no, because of uh, the land cover and land change. Uh, and because of land cover land change, the temperature has is been raising. The uh, rainfall is declining because of there's uh, less amount of rainfall. The migration of birds is little bit affecting in the how, arrival. How have we predicted that one uh, that the vegetation has become less? Everything. Ma'am, uh, uh, I'm taking ten years data. I have just kept only two. The uh, study is still uh, continuing. Compared to 2021, 22, 2022 has a high rainfall. Yes. So how you are able to justify all these things now? Sir, in uh, Vadavur, there is an increase in some birds. Increase in some birds. Uh, but in uh, uh, Karaviti, in Vadavur, uh, there is a decline in uh, many species and some has not arrived yet. In Karaviti, the bird uh, count has increased. Yes. No, it is not. Yes, sir. Because of PWD department, they have made some kind of modification in the Karavati and there is no bunding. Because of the water body is completely um, covered in everything. And the nesting behavior of the birds and the peak nesting behavior time, nesting time is not available. By that time, the plants and uh, trees are not available. That is why it has declined. Very recently, we have gone for a survey census along with our students. And we are we come to understand that uh, because of the PW department intuition that uh, all the birds are not coming in since the study is in still processor. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. You said 2022 yes. because of water, because of increase of water, yes. uh, the bird uh, arrival has been affected. Yes, is it true? No, that's, that's my question. Uh -huh. uh, the rainfall has decreased in some place during the seasons of monsoon, like. And one more thing, um, you, you in the first slide or the second slide, it seems, you mentioned that the proliferation of cell phone towers, yes. in what way it is affecting the population of birds? Uh, sir, it is the word which I have to be taken, but it is hard. I'm not uh, doing that yet. You didn't work on that? Ah, yes. Then you, you should not mention that. Ah, yeah. Actually speaking, the birds are not affected by the proliferation of uh, cell phone towers. The electromagnetic wave which is, which is released from the towers is not affecting the birds. Yes, Even in the forest, high level of uh, yeah, uh, towers are there and the, in the tower itself, uh, there are too many nesting behaviors. We have seen that. And I have a photograph of all these things. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. Now I call upon the next presenter, Gopi Anand, to present the paper on the title, 
explorative study on OB was spider diversity at Bishop Paper College campus. Good evening, everyone. I am G. Gopian from Third Base in Environmental Sciences, here to present my paper on explorative study on orb weaver spaces in uh, orb weaver family of spiders in our college campus. So we all know about here about spiders because uh, I have very have very curious to know about spiders because of Spider Man. We know all know that the spiders have bite and we can shoot the web. So on that, I have taken my spiders as my inspiration to go on this study. So. Spiders are the largest order of arachnids. We all know the spiders are an, uh, believe that we are insect. In Tamil, it's called ethical puchi, but spiders are not insects because the uh, insect has a uh, all insects should have six legs and antenna, but spiders have eight legs and they do not have antennas. Um, so our our study is to uh, document uh, there are uh, there is no more documentation related on spiders. Till now, there are only the two books we have we had to refer. We have till now we had to refer this one, one of Zoological Survey of India and the World Catalog Books on Spiders. We use that for education. Our main objective is to identify all viewer spiders in our college campus and to document uh, all viewer spiders because there are no more studies uh, related on spiders. So, what is the ecological role of all viewer spiders in our college campus? And to expand the family level identification on uh, to the genus and the species level, and uh, which is the, which is the particular species was dominating here in that obvio family. So we have we had two we have followed two methods: one by collecting by hands and by the photography. But commonly we have used the photography. Uh, if uh, which of the spiders are hanging down, we can't take the clear picture of the spiders. So which are the spiders are hanging downside? We use the collecting by hand. We have used the method collecting by hands. We have used the brushes to collect and in a container. And later, when it's hanging on the other side, we will take photographs and use the apps like Seek, uh, powered by iNaturalist, to identify which spider it is. And we have also used Wikipedias to refer which spider it is. And this is our result. Totally, we had 13 species we have identified in our college campus or we were. Uh, Family spiders we had in our campus, but in that thirteen species we had only eleven species uh, we have identified to the species level, and another two spiders we uh, we are not able to identify which uh, it's an obvious species obvious family, but we can't identify to the species level, like god and ten weaver spiny back obvious bridge obvious etc. Are uh, our findings in our college campus? So these were the findings and photographs. And these were the 13 obvious spiders. And in this one, the last two spiders we are not able to identify. Other all spiders were identified to the species level. And these two species, we can't identify which species it is, but it's an obvious belong to obvious family. And the ecological role is uh, our, in our college campus behind the behind the um, boys' hostels and the mess, there are some bushes and uh, Toilets let out. There are no more mosquitoes there. So these obvious spiders capture uh, feed on mosquitoes and dragonflies and wasps. These all pictures were taken in our college campus. This was the main ecological role of an uh, spiders here. And at the end of our my study, I had concluded that we have uh, totally thirteen obvious spiders in our college campus. Among that thirteen species, garden tent web spider. There is this 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 species and uh, Saint Andrew's cross spider. These two species were in the enormous, and uh, these these are a dominant species also. The spiders are effectively controlled in uh, mosquitoes, wasps, and beetles, or etc. And according to my objective, 
um, we have gone to we have gone to expand to the family level to the genus and the species level we, we can't identify two uh, two species and we believe that in the future we have we can do more study related on these spiders to explore the things thank you very good work you have done it in our campus itself uh, so we have uh, other species too uh, yes, uh, like butterfly uh, honey bees and all uh, are present wasp with other species you have said uh, it has a ecological benefit uh, the spiders yes, so uh, whatever spiders you have identified uh, here our students also they have done survey uh, uh, you have given the list of it whether it is endemic to this region or uh, any other spiders, any other spider you have found, uh, uh, which is uh, a new one reported uh, newly like that when you do the research. Um, there is, I, I, we did not notice about the endemic species, ma'am, because if we, if we can compare to the others having that, we can see the endemic. Huh? Um, other than that, we endemic had found... Endemic to this region, I'm not uh, Bishop we called ah. endemic to this. Uh, uh, according to um, that book is called uh, Geological yeah, Survey of India. In Trichirapalli, there are only six species they have reported, but no more species reported in that were found it here. Uh, yeah. 72, 72 species have been reported in Trichy. Oh, sorry, sir. according in uh, one literature I have seen there is only six in uh, 2018. I will add it on in future series. Okay, sir. Sir? Which time? What is the time? What is the time period you have taken for this? We have sir? not uh, taken specific time for this, sir. Throughout, if we have in breaks and we have just doing explorative study. What are all the species here having like that? If we have, we will go or go. Mostly we do it in our evening time. 2 to 5 p.m. we will do the study, sir. Actually, that time period is not a very active period for spiders. Ah, yes, sir. Actually, during our study, during uh, December, November and December time, ja jumping spiders are uh, green linux and jumping spiders are more or that. After a uh, gap, we have gone for uh, in January and February month in winter season. In that, all beaver spiders are starting to bloom and uh, there are more spiders. But we we did we do not we know don't know the reason we are trying to find why that species have become why that family become low and this family or getting up in this time. That depends upon the environmental resources. Ah, yes. Usually they are very active during the dusk period. Twilight, ah, yes, sir. Twilight period. Ah, so uh, you... other, there are some other family of spiders. They are active in the natural they are evening, evening time. We have the same photograph. Around 6.30, 7.30 time, uh, it will be very, very active. Ah, yes, sir. In other, there are uh, other families, sir. Yeah, yeah. Other families, spiders. Obvious, mostly found in morning times under. While you are doing the survey, have you noted the life cycle, everything, uh, how it uh, uh, designed the verb? Uh, ah, yes, ma'am. We have taken the photographs. Uh, some spiders have, uh, oh, the layers, like snake, they have uh, taken that, uh, the shells, they have. That, that, uh, Where did you locate uh, this uh, sp kind of spiders? In which region of our campus? In the of garden and uh -huh. background of the um, of hostel, college hostels. Uh -huh. And uh, be, beside the PG blocks, and where all the garden greens are there, we have noticed inside of our college campus there are only cellular spiders. That family odd weavers usually found in a garden areas. Okay. And you mentioned about the ecological role also. Ah, yes. Sir. How far they are effectively controlling the population of mosquitoes? Um, I think it was it was working more efficient because they are found mo mostly in the backside of our uh, boys and uh, boys and host, boys hostels. There are more mosquitoes. They webbed uh, especially that uh, garden tent or weaver. According to my guess, it will be more than five hundred species. If you can't, if you open any bushes, you will find that one behind the international hostel, and uh, this, there is more predominant here, sir. So, so you don't is, understand my question. How far uh, it is effective in mosquito control? Um, I can't say the what is the level it is, but it is efficiently because the, I whenever I see the web, there are more and more of mosquitoes and insects are there. 
so i think it's working on very good way to control the mosquitoes Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call upon the next presenter, Nisha, to present the paper on the title "Impacts of Climate Change and Water Quality on Zooplankton Abundance: A Study Towards Avian Richness and Conservation." Code BDC not five. Impact of climate change and water quality on zooplankton abundance a study towards on avian richness and conservation. Introduction, the average uh, surface water temperature was risen by 1 degree Celsius and it is predicted and to keep rising. Habitat loss and fragmentation loss are a uh, heavy threat to the biodiversity and a big issue for all sort of species. Birds are the external indicators of um, effects of climate change because they have variety of resources which allows them to perform essential ecological services like pollination, seed dispersal, nutrient dis uh, distribution, predation and scavenging. We can focus the analysis of water quality and reasons behind the migratory bird population or dropping with the use of analysis. Next is objective. The present study is we aim to analyze the water quality parameters, physiochemical changes of the lake, and to develop a link between climate change, water quality, and birds' richness or migration. The study is conducted on uh, Vadur Bird Sanctuary, Point Kalima, and Karavati Bird Sanctuary. Through the study, we can I determine the influence of water quality and identify the relationship with the decline or migration of selective birds. Actually, my topic is based on zooplankton abundance, but I'm still doing it. So I didn't add that. Comparing to water quality and birds migration only I added in this. Here is the methodology. For the purpose of analysis, the water's physiochemical protest, uh, Properties analyzed samples are taken from eight different places in uh, within the lake. The sample must be collected from our DO analysis should be done within six hours. And when comparing the uh, biological oxygen demand, the sample should be analyzed with the help of Winkler's method, which was incubated for five days at 20 degrees Celsius and another for four days at constant room temperature. For uh, analyzing the chemical oxygen demand, it was allowed for sunlight uh, about 90 minutes. This was the water quality analysis for result of Vadur Lake. Here, comparing to three lakes, Vadur has the highest COD level. In a fourth sample, it shows the 1250 mg per L, same as DOD level and same as DO level. Next, uh, the water quality analysis for Karaiveti Lake. It shows a fifth sample having the highest level of COD level and BOD level and DO level. Water quality analysis of Point Kalimar Lake. It shows the sixth sample has 920 mg per liter COD level and BOD level 70.2 mg per liter and DO level 14.5 mg per liter. This was a comparison of three lakes. It shows this. Vadur has the highest COD level, DO level, and BOD level. Next highest place of uh, having the pollutants of high COD, DO, and BO level is Point Kalimar. 
a comparison of three lakes, uh, Karaveti has the least pollutants. For the birds migration data, I collected from 2021 and 22. I am doing now, so I didn't add that data. Current data was not available. Then it's for Vadu Sanctuary. My conclusion is that the comparison study of three lakes, uh, Vadu Sanctuary has the highest level of COD, BO, and DO level. So it maybe affect the zooplankton level, but I didn't uh, say that because my zooplankton analysis study was currently processing. So I didn't add that. So that there was a huge number of declining population. There was huge number of declining of migrated birds in three uh, bird sanctuary. Uh, it has highest rate in uh, Vadur sanctuary. In Karaiviti, only uh, three birds are um, increased. Uh, they are barhead bees, painted stocks, and purple moon hen in Karaiviti sanctuary. From the collection of 2021 and 22 data, I conclude that. From the given uh, study, I analyzed that due to the pollutants, it may affect the birds' migration population. Thank you. But uh, you haven't given the correct data, no? Yes, ma'am. So just you are doing it is under the process, everything. Uh, yes, ma'am. It was my project was funded under the Becru, sir. So now only ex, uh, Friday only I got chemicals for everything. So I done only DO, BOD and COD level. That's only I done. Within the short span, I done three. With that, how can you predict uh, the result? Due to the pollutants, maybe it affect the water quality. Because it has high COD level, BO level and DO level. With that, how can you conclude? You have to explain other ecological factors too. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Now I call upon the next presenter, M. Belshia Catherine, to present the paper on the title, A Review on Impacts of Ocean Acidification in Marine Organisms to Mitigate Climate Change. Code BDC08. Good afternoon to all. I'm Belcia Catherine from 2nd BSc Environmental Science. My topic is based on the impact on ocean acidification in marine organisms to mitigate the climate changes. First of all, what is, what is ocean acidification? Due to the anthropogenic CO2 emission by fossil fuel burning, the release of CO2 is being reacting with the oceanic water. Because of that, the at pH level of the ocean decreases. By decreasing the pH level directly affect the marine organism and it affects the biogeochemical cycle of that species. The increase, uh, the decrease in the pH level directly influence the temperature change in the ocean surface water levels, ma'am. Although the climate change can be controlled, the acidification process change can take more than a year to uh, take into control. Because of that only the ocean acidification is based on an important topic in this session. My objective is to tell how the increased CO2 level influence both the climate change and the acidification of ocean, wa ocean water. Man. Due to the uh, decrease in the pH level, it directly influences the polar region to melt the glacier surface. By, by melting the glacier, by melting the glaciers, they directly influence in the increase in the sea, sea water level count level. The inorganic carbon 
will directly affect the calcifying organisms. The decrease in uh, pH level can be controlled only by uh, reducing the CO2 emission in the atmosphere. Until this, until we are balancing the uh, CO2 level in the terrestrial and uh, ocean surface, the acidification, the climate change, both as a major trouble due to the CO2 emissions. This can be minimized only by uh, using green technology and uh, renewable energy sources. By controlling the fossil fuel uh, burning, we can reduce the CO2 emission into the atmosphere. Green, techno green technology is a method which is known as umbrella method. It includes varieties of uh, methodology in uh, effectively increasing, decreasing the CO2 level in atmosphere. For example, blue hydrogen. It is a fuel type uh, hydrogen fuel. It is uh, taken from the methane gas from uh, storing the CO2 which has been emitted by the uh, burning of methane and uh, separating the hydrogen from them. And it, the uh, hydrogen which has been separated is known as blue hydrogen. It can be used as a fuel in it. Next, renewable energy. As we all know, it is it, uh, renewable energy means it is a replenishable energy from uh, natural resources. Many new technology have been emerged in the uh, renewable energy sectors like uh, bladeless wind energy, Bladeless wind energy means a windmill which is which is in the absence of blades. Here, the elastic towers are being used with the vibration. The energy is being uh, detected and used for uh, some other purposes. Next, rechargeable tires. By using some bio geo biochemicals, uh, the tires can be altered uh, for various geography features and uh, the production of tires can be reduced through this process. Next, by implementing printed solar energy trees, by this we can uh, efficiently uh, use the solar energy powers. Next, carbon nanotubes. By using this also, we can reduce the CO2 level. Conclusion, by minimizing the amount of CO2, we can uh, decrease the solubility of uh, dissolved inorganic ca carbon in our ocean surface. By this, the uh, acidification is being slowed down. As the acidification is slowed down, the marine organism will have a stable life in it. And the balance acidi acidity and basicity will normalize the biodiversity cycle. So that only uh, the G2, G20 have been uh, assigned to form zero carbon emission by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now I call upon the next presenter, N. Shubhapriya to present the paper on the title, Assessment of Butterflies in Bishop Paper College, Tiruchrapalli, Tamil Nadu. Code BDC-09. Good afternoon, everyone. This is N. Subapriya from the Department of Environmental Science. Only one out of person.
Good afternoon, everyone. This is N Subapriya from the Department of Environmental Sciences. Now I'm gonna present about the topic assessment of butterflies in Bishop Heber College, Tirchrapalli. So we all know about butterflies from the childhood. We are seeing butterflies. It is colorful, bright, and attractive. And uh, yes, butterfly have large and colorful wings, and also uh, they are the effective pollinators and indicators in the ecosystem. And they act as pollinator prey biological pest control induce genetic variation in plants and also enhance environmental beauty so uh, our aim is to assess the butterfly population in bishop heber college campus so we took two objectives and the first one is to assess the butterfly population and the second one is to study the diversity of butterfly species so bishop heber college is our study area we all know it is a wide campus with uh, more than 55 species of trees and 116 species of other native and introduced plants and the materials and methodology and our study we i carried it uh, during february and march month 2023 in the morning time and then uh, we followed three methods who has shown us random walk method line transect and point count method so uh, now i'm jumping to the result and discussion so the first one is uh, totally we observed 25 species and 671 individual butterflies we observed and from the families lichenidae papilionidae nymphalidae pyridae and hesperidae as you can see there we just uh, observed 156 butterfly individual butterfly species in papillonidae family 180 butterfly species in nymphalidae family 196 in lichenidae family 89 in pyridae and 50 individual butterflies in hesperidae family so as you can see there the maximum number of butterflies were observed in the family lichenidae and the minimum number of butterflies were observed in the family hesperidae and all the butterflies belongs to one common order lepidoptera and uh, my conclusion is Bishop Heber College campus is filled with beautiful and bountiful uh, species of butterflies. Conserving and protecting them is our responsibility and it is important because they are the indicator of healthy ecosystem and helps in ecological balancing. Thank you. Well done. Uh, in two months, how can you... Uh, survey this many butterflies you have said uh, in different orders different uh, uh, numbers you have said no yes uh, ma'am we surveyed in the morning time from 9 30 to 11 30 and uh, yes we observe those butterflies ma'am. that many species you have identified uh, 25 species we identified ma'am. but you have mentioned there are so many species no, ma'am, 25 species, 671 butterfly, individual butterflies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the presentation. Now I call upon the next presenter, J.N. Shiolin Mishna, to present the paper on the title Review on Environmental Impacts and Implementation of Sustainable Solution in Sago Industries. Code SI05. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sherlyn Mishna. I'm here to present on the paper entitled Review on Environmental Impacts and Implementation of Sustainable Solutions in Sago Industries. I have chosen this topic to in incorporate sustainable goals such as uh, life below water, clean and water sanitation, and innovation infrastructure and industries. Uh, and uh, here with the introduction, Sago is an edible food which is extracted from the pith of Sago palm as well as the tubers of uh, tapioca. It is rich in uh, carbohydrate and with the trace elements of calcium and vitamin C. I have chosen this uh, topic because the sago industries produce a lot of environmental uh, impacts. The untreated effluents from the sago industries uh, 
which has a great impact in uh, re in reducing high de demand of uh, biological oxygen demand as well as chemical oxygen demand in the water bodies. Uh, the untreated water effluent contains carbohydrates, cellulose, and cyanoglycosides, which uh, readily affect the aquatic life uh, below the water. And my objectives of the research are to analyze the impact of environmental pollutions caused by sago industry, to implement sustainable solutions to treat uh, industrial effluent, to incorporate circular economy ideas to benefit these stakeholders. And coming to my materials and method, uh, I have used uh, secondary research uh, method. Uh, the data are collected from the uh, uh, researchers who have published their data in the international and national journals. The step of my uh, researcher, first I have identified the subject and related topics uh, uh, related to Sago industries, waste and utilization. Uh, secondly, I have collected the data and I have collected various data from various resources. And finally, I have analysis and conclude my research. And coming to the results and discussion, uh, the main impact of uh, Sago industries are effluents. So the effluents contains a lot of methane, and methane is one of the greenhouse gases uh, which results in increasing global warming. When the industries uh, adopt anaerobic uh, digester in their effluent plants, it has a great uh, remedy uh, to reduce the methane emission. Dur during the process of anaerobic digester, methane gas can be harvested, and the harvested methane gas can be used in uh, power consumption and commercial utilization. Secondly, when the sago water is fermented with aspergillus nigger, it can be used as a, a fodder for the cattle feed. Uh, the study has been done in Malaysia by Lani and et al. Secondly, uh, due to the carbohydrate content in the uh, sago water, it can be used to uh, cultivate algae. And thirdly, uh, the research uh, has been done in Indonesia by Siswo Sumarino. When they have uh, fermented uh, sago, weight or sago waste water with uh, trichoderma species, they has been found that uh, crude uh, fiber content can be reduced and the high uh, crude uh, protein has been increased. And finally, uh, sago starch is widely used in pharmaceutical industries as a binding agent in the formation of tablets. And secondly, using the sago starch, edible fl uh, films can be prepared with partially hydrolyzation. And third one is, it can be used as an alternative to chemical-based plastics in the packaging industries. Also, it can be a very cheap alternative to agar. As uh, starch, uh, sago starch are gelating agent, which can be easily used in the uh, uh, gelating, forming jellies and candy, so on. And finally, uh, sago starch contains a very good amount of glucose, which can be used to produce ethanol. And the ethanol are used widely in the beverage uh, industries. So when the sago industries adopt these mechanisms, they can uh, additionally improve their economy level. Coming to the conclusion, uh, sago waste can be used as both as food and non-food applications. And the second important one is uh, clean development mechanism. Uh, methane can be uh, generated from the effluents and it can be uh, used as an energy. And finally, giving awareness to the uh, stakeholders about the sustainable management of waste as well as the circular economy ideas beyond the sago waste pollution helps to uh, uh, get more additional income uh, from their source of income. And here are my reference. Thank you all. It's a review article, ma'am. By using this, you can do the project itself. I sir. I'm currently in my first year of PG. 
and um, i'd have done this review article and further uh, in my final year i can do it as a research by collecting samples from the sago industries <laughs> thank you sir thank you for the presentation now i call upon the next presenter kartikeya yes to present the paper on the title a review on current prospects of mushroom cultivation different agro ways code si03 good afternoon one and a present here myself kartikeyan from the department of environmental sciences bishop ibba college suchi my presentation is a review on mushroom cultivation by using different agro wastes as we all know mushroom is a macro fungus with unique fruiting body it decomposes organic matter to grow which is the substrate uh, there are many species of edible mushroom here i have used uh, pleurotus ostriatus this uh, use substrate as nutri uh, nutrition sources uh, which are several agro wastes and paper waste my objective is part of it uh, my ultimate aim is to evaluate the growth and yield performance of oyster mushroom using paper waste and other agro wastes and to encourage students uh, to sign up in the field of entrepreneurship during their college days and uh, required materials for this cultivation of uh, mushroom is mushroom spawn plastic bags uh, with size 12 is to 24 ratio substrate is like cocoa pith sawdust uh, bamboo leaves paper wastes rice husk and paddy straw is used uh, finally we need a dark room with high uh, humidity and low temperature for uh, this mushroom cultivation uh, sterilization process it is the first process and essential process because we need only fungi uh, mycelium to grow in our bag not other microorganisms so we sterilize the bag uh, the bag and uh, the substrate we have to sterilize it to sterilize we have to immerse uh, immerse the substrates in uh, boiling water after uh, sterilization it the substrates are cooled and dried next uh, bagging part of it it is a typical process after certain practice we can do it so for a steady purpose i have added a different substrates in different ratios as such as 25 is to 75 50 is to 50 and 100 percentage and finally i had a own control bag uh, in very dark room we hung the uh, bags so it requires moisturization uh, we hung it in a dark room next one comes uh, the incubation period where the mycelium forms and growth of mushroom is started Uh, finally after the bud comes out within 2 days uh, we can harvest it uh, my result is uh, in uh, fully paddy straw bag it took uh, bag it took more than 70 days to cultivation whereas in 25 percentage and 75 percentage paper waste it took only 15 to 16 days to cultivate so in no paper bag uh, it growed within 20 days so the point is when i used our conventional substrate paddy as a substrate it consumes more time uh, with more yield but when i used uh, paper waste and other agro wastes it used uh, only less time with uh, low yield thank you and thank you the title is of that we uh, have used different uh, agro waste for uh, mushroom cultivation is it paper and uh, paper waste and bamboo leaves uh, bamboo leaves cocoa pith then uh, sardes rice husk and paddy straw ma'am other substrate uh, will be explained by my colleague she is also in this project next so topic you one or you have done it ma'am you have done the one. Uh, we have done this work ma'am for this presentation only review ah uh, for this presentation i have a uh, review ma'am it is also my ug project Uh, other colleague is uh, presenting that part of it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I I want to mention one thing. Yes. If you do, is is paper is an ag agro waste? 
no sir uh, agro waste and paper waste okay if you are using papers yes. are you using the uh, unprinted paper or no, sir, printed paper uh, for those inks that part of it so if use... suppose it is an int- printed paper ultimately we are producing uh, mushrooms yes sir and that is actually the food um, when you are using the printed paper it emits lead uh, yes, so for a toxicity test we have to go with now only we have got that yield sir we have dried it and uh, make it as powder certainly yes. yes it may contain lead toxic lead and uh, we have to take lead test and bps yes sir. it may contain yes but how far it is useful how for the economy purpose when uh, we can for the economy it. purpose we can use but uh, for the sustainable Concept. environment uh, our development towards uh, sustainability and it would definitely transform yes. of course we should not give importance for the economy yes but economy part of it that's what my ultimate aim is to make students as so that is what has been mentioned in the inaugural function uh-huh. most of the time the country is uh, working on the economy part not on the environment part they are leaving other of course you are also doing the same no <laughs> what to do sir <laughs> we will work on with that what to, how to reduce that lead content sure yeah lead definitely it, yes. it will contain it, it sure. contain the uh, lead it may contain lead let that be my msc project that, that's a carcinogenic yes. agent right? yes sir we should not uh, admit, admit all these things and for the growth of uh, what is that yes. uh, mushrooms i try as it's one of the important foods uh, nowadays no more demand for this mushrooms. yeah yeah that is why yes. thank you thank good you. work thank you for the presentation now i call upon the next presenter mr prasitha to present the paper on the title comparative analysis on yield rate of oyster mushroom cultivation on sawdust and coco peat code si07 Good afternoon everyone myself prasiddha from department of environmental sciences bishop ibe college trichy and my topic is about comparative analysis of yield rate of pyrotus ostritus oyster mushroom cultivation on coco peat and sawdust so uh, i think you're all familiar with mushrooms right they are a common food delicacy used all, all over the world for their taste and mushrooms belong to the kingdom fungi and under the phylum of basidiomycetes they are commonly called uh, club fungi unlike plants they do not produce their own food but instead they secrete their digestive enzymes in order to obtain their nutrients so the type of mushroom that i used for my uh, project is oyster mushroom which is called pleurotus ostritus it actually got its name because it has similar resemblance to that of uh, the shape of the shell of uh, oyster a marine organism it is a molluscan uh next i mainly use coco peat and sawdust as my substrate so coco peat is nothing but a coir corky material that is present outside of the hard coconut shell and sawdust is nothing but a by product it is a waste material that we usually obtain from the wood furnishing industry uh during uh, like uh, sawing or during shaping etc So now I'm going to tell you about the steps that I follow in my mushroom cultivation. The first one is the preparation of spawn, which is also called a uh, mushroom grain or mushroom seed. Uh, currently, in our lab, we don't have enough facilities for the preparation of mushroom grain. So I purchase my grain from Spawn House Trichy. Uh, and the next step is preparation of mushroom bed, which is commonly called substrate. So the first and foremost thing that you have to do is that you have to soak your substrate in water for about two to three hours so that it can absorb the moisture. the next most crucial step is you have to sterilize ter- sterilize it so that you can uh, avoid any contamination of any other microorganisms uh, you can use uh, two methods for sterilizing it you can either boil it in water or you can autoclave it but in my project i boiled all my substrates in water then i drained off excess water i dried it in the sheet or or in a cloth you can dry it in a, either in a sheet or cloth 
uh, your substrate should be present in such a way that if you touch it, it should be wet and damp. But if you squeeze it, no, no single drop of water should be, uh, no single water should be dripping from that substrate. Only then your substrate will be ready. And the next step is uh, preparation of bags. Uh, for this, I used polythene bags of 33 into 48 centimeters, which can hold the capacity of up to three to four kgs. Uh, I tied one end of the bag tightly with rubber bands, and then I sprinkled a small amount of corn in it. Then I layered it with the substrate of up to five centimeter level. Then I again sprinkled a uh, spawn on the corners of the bags. I repeated it until I got five layers of substrate and uh, four layers of spawn. Then I tied the other end of the bag with rubber bands. And then you have to puncture the holes on all the sides equally. I punctured four holes on each side. You have to keep it uh, aside for 10 days. You don't need to. Uh, so these are all the results I uh, got uh, with mixed substrate. I used sawdust with paddy straw in different ratios. Uh, sword is 75 percentage and paddy is 25 percentage. So this was on day 16. You can see the full mycelium growth. And day 18, uh, you can see the mushroom growth. And day 20, I harvested it. And the same I did with sawdust with paddy straw in 50 to 50 ratio and sawdust in 100 percentage. Uh, the same I did for cocoa peat. So the result is the overall yield from all the bags of sawdust in mixed substrate with paddy straw. I got about 296.19 grams. And for cocoa peat, I got 259.6 grams. Uh, so the yield of uh, sawdust is comparatively higher than that of cocoa peat. And from the control, from 100% paddy straw, I got 301.12 grams. Uh, even though the growth of uh, mushrooms is higher in paddy straw, the difference is not that much. Uh, in sawdust and uh, cocoa pit. So what I conclude is that uh, cocoa pit and sawdust also serves as a very good uh, uh, growth medium for mushrooms. So those uh, those people who live near coconut grooves or who are near wood furnishing industries can purchase these raw materials and these act as a very good substrate uh, for growing mushrooms in a small scale level. Which one has a low cost cocoa pit? Sawdust, sawdust uh, cost wise, sawdust is lesser. Low. low. On what basis you are uh, mixing the ratios? Sir? You have different ratios of uh, sawdust and uh, cocoa pit. Like uh, what no? I did was I mixed it, I took sawdust and mixed it with uh, paddy straw in different ratios. First, I took 100% sawdust and then 50 50 ratio, 50% paddy straw, 50% sawdust, 75% sawdust, and 25% paddy That's what straw. I'm asking, on what basis you are. Uh, I just wanted to know how much that is the crude, growth, rate, growth rate of mushrooms. Just a crude uh, yeah. idea. I just want to know how much it affects the growth rate of the mushroom in different ratios. Not nutrient based, just a crude based. Uh, no, we are uh, currently our work is in progress. After yielding all the mushrooms, we are drying it and then we'll be sending it for nutrient analysis, such as mm -hmm. protein, lipid. No, I'm asking about the raw material. Manure. Uh, not on. Uh... Not depends upon the uh, nutrient resources. No, sir. Crude. Yes, sir. But you are able to get good result on 50 50 ratio. Yes. And... So, sawdust. Uh, sawdust has. Uh, that is your prescription. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you.
we owe a special gratitude to the delegates for being a major part of the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. As the resource person is waiting online, we'll have a pause in the technical session and we can move on to the plenary session too. The remaining presenters will present after the plenary session.
Ma'am, are we audible? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Think big. Trust yourself and make it happen. A very good afternoon to one and all gathered here. We welcome you all for the pl second plenary session of the day. We are privileged to welcome Dr. Sh Dr. Shirley Lydia, who is our illustrious alumnus. Now, I invite Dr. D. Udayabano, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental Sciences, to introduce the resource person of the day. Good afternoon, one and all gathered here. Good afternoon and good morning, ma'am. I hope so. <laughs> good morning. This morning there. So, uh, here, here I am to uh, introduce our uh, resource person, Shirley uh, Lydia Winson. She is the illustrious alumnus of our department. And uh, she is uh, currently uh, residing in the American continent. We are very happy to hear uh, to introduce. I'm very happy to introduce you here, ma'am. So I just I want to preface about her. So she's uh, completed her master's of environmental science at our college and uh, was the recipient of the gold medal for being the university topper. and. Uh, she has won multiple awards, uh, especially Enterprising Women of the Year by EW, CEO of the Year by Go Global, Women Business Owner of the Year by Now, and Company of the Year by SVUS in the gold category. So her passion is mentoring women in business and STEM careers. She is a certified small business mentor with SCORE, a subsidiary of a small business administration, United States. She Passion has led her to co-found Synergy and uh, non-profit committed to empowering minorities and women in business. Currently, she is living in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. We welcome you, ma'am. We are ha ha very happy to be as a resource person for this international conference. Thank you, Ms. Odea. I really appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Now we hand over the session to you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, can the admin allow me to share my screen? Yes, I can. Share now. So um, let me know when you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's with All right. All right, we are on. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Rudeya Bano, for the uh, wonderful introduction. I appreciate uh, all your coordination. I'd like to thank the Bishop Eber College Principal Dr. Diabran, Vice Principal Professor Moses, and the leaders from the inaugural session for giving me this opportunity to present. Well, what time is it? Around 4.30 in the evening for you guys? So probably a good time to take a nap, right? I guess I'm going to try really hard to keep you all awake. Well, let's get into the presentation. The United Nations has set 17 sustainable goals, which is a call for action for all developed and developing countries. The topic we will be discussing today is goal number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. My name is Shirley, and I'll be talking about how responsible consumerism and purpose-driven brands can shape our economy towards a sustainable future. Uh, let's first make sure we all understand what a sustainable or a sustainable development means. There are different definitions. I'm pretty sure you're all research students and uh, scholars in the room, but I'd like to still start with this slide. Uh, the most commonly used definition is from the Brundtland Report, which says sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In other words, we need to be responsible stewards. Manufacturing industries are the major contributors to unsustainable consumption and production. 
Therefore, they play a major role in helping us achieve the sustainable development goal number 12 by creating solutions that benefit society and the environment. Here, we're gonna talk about what these industries and brands can do to help achievers goal number 12. It can be achieved via many means. For example, RRR. Now I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about reduce, reuse and recycle. And this, is, this, this has been our mantra for so many years, right? And it's still the same. Um, and we can uh, use renewable energy sources and also reduce industrial pollution. These are most of the common things that we have seen that could help us with this goal number 12. Here's a list of 11 targets set to achieve for SDG goal number 12. I'm not gonna go into all of these. You can Google this up on, on the United Nations page. You should see all these targets. But today we will see some of the ways in which we can achieve these targets in this presentation. Now, who is responsible for creating a sustainable future? I believe you guys have iPhones. Can we take a quick poll of the audience? I'm gonna share on my screen a QR code. Take out your iPhones if you have your smartphones. Um, do the QR code or go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com and enter the code number. Are you able to do that? There will be, you'll see one question on your screen, on your iPhone screen. Please answer the question. Let's see how this session pulls this question. Are you guys able to do that? Yes, ma'am. All right. If you are too far away for the QR code, you can also type in slide.com on your browser. All right, I'm gonna, these are the results. All right, so there is 78% of you who says all of the above. I guess we have a room full of smart people. Okay, let's go back. I'm gonna stop the poll. Let's get back into our presentation. Okay, here is how the world has responded to this question, right? So an EY report says that only 68% of global consumers expect businesses to solve sustainability issue. But in reality, you guys are correct. The businesses, consumers, lawmakers, everyone are all stakeholders in achieving this goal. So first let's talk about how brands can lead the way to a sustainable future. So here's some of the ways. The first one is adopting sustainable practices, moving from a linear to a circular supply chain economy. So what is a linear chain and what is a circular chain economy? So if you look at this slide, if you look at the picture on the left, that depicts the linear economy of a supply chain. 
So where the products are produced, transported, and consumed in a linear manner. For instance, the raw material are moved to the supplier and from the supplier, it's transported to the factory, the manufacturing facility where the products are made and then transported to the distribution center uh, or warehouses and to the retail stores. And then it ends up in the, with the customer. So along all of these um, areas, we still see waste that are emitted out in the uh, environment. So this is a linear economy. And the push is moving towards the circular economy. So if you look at the uh, picture on the right, that's a depiction of a circular economy. So a circular supply chain is a, is a model that emphasizes circularity and sustainability. Here, waste is minimized in every stage. So if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see a special step that's introduced, which is called the design. So that's the most important part of circular economy because they are designing products, keeping in mind reusability of the product, how to reduce the waste during the production, and how to keep the environment safe and sustainable. So that's more important weightage is given in that process. So the raw material moves towards the design and then to production and then again to distribution and then it's being consumed. So when, when the product is consumed, like I said, it's given, uh, the product is designed in such a way that you can repair and reuse it. And also the brand collects the wastage, recycles them and, and produce, uh, cre creates them back as raw materials and puts them back into the circular process. So do, this is how a circular economy works. In a linear economy, more weightage is given to efficiency and minimizing cost. But in a circular economy, more weightage is given to designing products that are, that are easy to repair, reuse, or recycle. So what are the other areas brands can help? Um, okay, even before this, this is what the report says, right? To maintain the level, livability of our world, we must double the circularity economy from less than, right now it's less than 10%, and that needs to be about 20% uh, to be able to uh, make this world livable. What are the other ways brands can help? Sus adopt sustainable business operations. So pledging towards a net zero footprint. Um, I saw a lot of, I heard a lot of research students talk about climate change as one of the major reason, reason for, um, uh, for declining population of, I believe, birds and uh, we talked about uh, butterflies. There are a lot of people who talk about that. And there's also one mention about uh, net zero footprint by 2030. So um, the IPCC panel has recommended that we need to keep or limit the global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius in order to achieve net zero emissions by around 2050. So what is net zero? Net zero is a term used to describe a state where the amount of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere is balanced by the amount of greenhouse gases removed from the atmosphere through natural or artificial means. So how is this possible? So energy, Energy use contributes to 75% of our emissions globally. And energy, the total energy consumption equal, equates to electricity, transportation, and heating. Transportation and heating are a little bit harder to decarbonize, but clean electricity can be produced and this will become even more important. Why? Many solutions rely on electrifying other parts of the energy system, for example, to decarbonize transportation, we can all think of electric vehicles. Tesla is a pioneer. And now in India, there are many brands that has joined the race to produce electric vehicles like Tata, Mahindra, Hyundai, Kia. So if we are to reap the climate benefits of the electric vehicles, this electricity that powers these vehicles need to come from a low carbon source. So the clean energy, production of clean er energy is even more important for us to have a low carbon um, footprint. The international, okay, these are some of the top sources of, sources of clean energy. You must already know this. The International Energy Agency projects that by 2030, global electricity demand for electric vehicles alone can increase up to 11 times compared to its need in 2019. So that puts the pressure more on generating clean electricity. 
Here's a snapshot of the distribution of electricity across globe by source. Um, if you see, you still have 60% of electricity across the, uh, the globe is produced by coal and natural gas, and that needs to change. Excuse me. And again, I have a small link at the bottom of this um, slide. I actually stumbled up upon this map. This is a um, website that shows live data about um, um, how each country across the globe and what is the real uh, the carbon intensity of their electricity production. I'm going to show you this so you can understand better. So this is um, the map that I came across. So if you see, this is a global map, and um, this this data I, I'm I'm saying I'm I'm displaying data in the past 24 hours. This is like real time. It shows how each state in the United States, and I, I'm right here, or in, uh, each, even even to the county level, it shows a carbon footprint in its energy production. For example, let's see here. This is Ontario, Canada. If you look at here, scroll here, I can see. 20, they have a carbon intensity of 24 grams. This is, a, again, this is an electricity map. They have obtained at, attained 97% of low carbon and 40% of re renewable sources are being used to produce electricity in that region. So I live in North Carolina. I was interested in going to North Carolina right here. And I, I can see that in our state, 51% of low carbon fuel is used to produce electricity. Let's go to India. Um, there you are. There's actually the gray areas are areas where we don't have data. Right now we have no data from Southern India. And here's the Western India, data from Western India. Here you can see that uh, the electric that they have a carbon footprint of uh, intensity of 552 grams. And the electricity production source is 32% low carbon and 27% renewable. So that's pretty interesting facts. And there are a lot of green regions up here. You see here, this is Sweden. They are 100% low carbon and renewable. And this is all parts of Sweden. If you see, they are all green, which means they have achieved maximum efficiency in um, creating electricity from low carbon and renewable, renewable energy sources. So that was really interesting for me. You can play around um, later on. So let me go back into my presentation. So here's a little bit of a tidbit. So these are the top seven emitters uh, that accounted for almost half of the green global uh, greenhouse gas in 2020. Um, so here's a list of how some forward thinking brands are leading the way for us. This would sum up my presentation so far. Setting aggressive emission reduction targets. They publicly, po they publicly post these numbers. They, they create a, a set a target and they post data on how they are measuring up to their target. Entering into the net zero pledge publicly. This, this is also one of the requests of the climate by the climate panel in the Paris Agreement. So the last time I checked, 75% of the focus companies have committed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Are we going to achieve it by 2050? We don't know. Uh, we might be a little off track, but we don't know yet. But that's the goal or that's the pledge at least that these brands have made. The embedding ESG, environment, social and governance priorities into the business strategies of all of the brands. And then moving towards circular economy in the supply chain, like we talked about. It's not just moving each of the brand into the circular economy, but they are also um, considering uh, their supply chain, their vendors in their supply chain. They are vetting their vendors based on their low carbon footprint as well. So that's also ongoing by some of the industries or brands that are leading the way. Uh, reducing their operational carbon footprint. Consider the carbon footprint of every vendor in the supply chain process, like I said. Some companies have already reduced their corporate travels uh, by reducing the transportation. Um, they are giving uh, the, the, the environment a little bit cleaner. And some strategies are as simple as replacing motion sensor switches in their corporate restrooms to conserve energy. And lastly, promoting sustainable products. 
You will even find on Amazon and other online retailers a small icon that denotes a product as eco-friendly or environment safe or some kind of a logo. So people have started, a lot of brands have started putting those uh, kind of logos for consumers to, in, uh, to indicate to us that that is produced in a sustainable way or in an eco-friendly way. All right. Um, so uh, brands to keep global warming to more than, um, I mean, brands can shape our economy towards a sustainable future by promoting environmentally conscious practices. And some of the brands that are leading the way are brands like Exxon, BP, Procter & Gamble. And even Amazon is the one who's leading the way and is a big advocate for companies to make the pledge. All right. So that, that, that slide came a little bit early. I guess you're still awake. Um, so let's play uh, to wake some of us who are not. Let's play a small game of quiz. You ready for a quiz? Okay, I guess you all have your um, iPhones. Please take your iPhones out. Um, I guess you have uh, only 10 groups can join. I want you to get together in a group. If you're on a row, make that row could be a group. Create a group among yourself. And the first 10 groups can enter um, this quiz. So you will see on the screen a QR code. So point your phones to a QR code. Only one person in that group can be a leader for that group. So the rest can answer the questions and one person can key in the data into the quiz. Um, so go to the QR code or you can go to www.kahoot.it and enter that game pin and it'll ask you to enter a nickname for your team. So enter a nickname for your team and join. If you are alone by yourself in any row, you can, you're welcome to come back and join the row in front of you, or you can join. Okay, welcome, A-K-A-N. I'll give you a few more minutes for people to join. Oh, come on, your nickname, okay. yeah. Hello, the Dino team. All right, what powerful name. Welcome, Suku. Welcome, Mahi. Welcome, Dub. We have five teams. Welcome, Arasa. Six teams. Welcome, Oli. Wow, achievers. Hi, let's see how you achieve today. There's two more who can still participate. I'll give you two more seconds if anyone else is still punching your nickname. Rockers, welcome rockers. All right, we have our 10 teams. Welcome skate. All right, guys ready? There are, we have 15 questions. Listen carefully. Good luck to all of the team. The, um, I know we already did a poll and we have, oh, we, we have one more, Sandy. We, we have 15 questions in this quiz. So I, once I start the quiz on your screen, you will see a question on the main screen. Um, and on your phone, you will see the four options. You'll only see the four options. You see what are the four options are on your screen and you hit the options, you think it's the right option, all right? on your phone, you answer on your phone, but you watch the question on the screen.
All right, that's your results.
All right, that ends our quiz for today. So let's see who is the winner. AKN, third place, second place, the Dino team. First place is Dub, congratulations. Okay, that's wonderful. So I guess everybody is awake now. So let's continue with our presentation. We still have just a couple more slides. We just, before the quiz, again, let me talk about the quiz. That was a wonderful, I hope you all had a wonderful time um, answering. So you guys did well. Um, let's, before the quiz, we talked about how brands are leading the way to help with sustainable um, development. And we'll talk about responsible consumerism, how you and I can help. So our first poll indicated that the consumers are equally responsible for a sustainable future. So what can we do? Reduce consumption. So this is one of the most effective ways to promote sustainability. This includes buying only what you need, avoiding impulse purchases. I think all women, including me, has to listen to this. So buy only what you need, and avoid impulse purchases and choose the products with minimal packaging. Choose sustainable products. Look for products that are made from sustainable materials such as organic cotton, bamboo, or recycled materials that are durable and repairable. Support sustainable companies that are companies that are committed to sustainability, like we talked about the environmental logo, the eco-conscious eco logo. So support such companies. Use energy efficient appliances. So look for high ratings for energy efficiency when you're purchasing home appliances. This not only helps lower your carbon footprint, but also helps reduce your energy. Educate yourself on sustainability issues, which is very important. Not just the environmental science students, right? But everyone, every person here is a consumer on this world. And you need to educate yourself and should understand the impact of your choices as a consumer. So stay informed on environmental issues and support policies and promote sustainability. Choose sustainable transportation. Use public transportation, bicycle or walk for shorter distances. It, this walking not only helps your health, um, I mean, not only as, um, helps the environment, but helps, your, helps you get back in shape. And if you have to drive, choose a fuel efficient vehicle or consider carpooling or ride sharing. And buy locally, choose products um, that are produced locally to reduce the environmental impact of transportation. Spread the word. That's the easiest thing you can do um, is to spread the word using your smartphone these days, right? So let the world know that you are engaging in something good. Update it on your social media pages and set an example for all your friends and families. So by taking these actions as a responsible consumer, you can help promote a sustainable future. So we, so we are on our last slide. In conclusion, everyone needs to pitch in and do our part if we want a sustainable future. So if you are a consumer, we all are, right? Make responsible choices. If you are a brand or a leader uh, in working in a, in a brand, Establish sustainable business practices, commit to net zero targets. If you are an innovator or in the future, if you will be, develop technologies and infrastructure that minimize our impact on the environment. If you're you an investor, invest into sustainable brands and businesses. If you are a regulator or a politician, 
give priority to sustainability and pass laws that govern and promote environmental friendly practices. If you are an educator, keep educating everyone in your sphere of influence on how to make environmentally conscious choices. It is you and I who can make tomorrow better. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now the session is open for discussion. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for a nice presentation regarding the how responsible consumers uh, purpose driven into a sustainable future. Uh, ma'am, uh, this is a, I can say this is a nice presentation uh, regarding that nowadays a sustainable environment and economy is are the topic uh, are interesting in the world. So, but uh, myself, I did one uh, research regarding on sustainable uh, fashion, uh, fashion. So to understand the, the different uh, attitude from different respondents. I did it like in, in Trichy, where they, we conducted uh, like a, uh, one research to know if people are interested and also they know what is this sustainable like a sustainable fashion, but the, we have seen uh, more than uh, more than 60 people, even educated one, they are, they, are, they are not aware about sustainable fashion. So they don't know. Uh, and the, we are sustainable, uh, sustainable cons for consumers. It's very important for everyone. But the problem, even educated one, they don't know what is this sustainable environment or sustainable development. We are not uh, able to understand. So is there any suggestions or any contribution that we can make? Because we are talking sustainable development every day, but even educated people, most of them, they don't know this term. They don't know the importance of that. Is there any contribution or any uh, 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 suggestion for that? Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Great. I think your question has the answer in itself, right? <clears throat> First, let's see educated. Like you said, even the educated person don't know about sustainable fashion. So, what do you? How do you define educate? Education doesn't mean just getting a degree, right? So, everybody needs to understand. As an environmental science student, as a research person, you did your own research. We all understand what sustainable development is but not any of anyone else, maybe an engineering graduate, they might not know, they might not know about their machines, right? So that's why education is more important. We need to educate, keep telling, even if, if they don't have a degree, if you educate them, social media is everywhere, your WhatsApp is everywhere. So we all know a latest movie that's coming on. We all know about the latest song release functions, but let's make this a priority. Start sharing, start educating. If everyone's, you, you don't need to go into a college to learn environmental sciences to understand sustainability. Everybody can learn from their iPhones. Everybody have their phones. So what, uh, and again, it's a responsible decision that you make, right? Even if you know about sustainable fashion, so how how would you be, be, choose between, like say for the, for the ladies, right? So there are two, uh, saris, saris that you want to choose from and a sustainable sari doesn't look so good but another sari, sari that's not a sustainably developed sari looks good and more fashionable more trending so that's what you choose so it, it it is a responsibility of every consumer and also price also drives a bigger part right so if a sustainably developed uh, um, product a fashion product is costs higher than a non-sustainability produced one. So that also is a decision point for every consumer. So there are, uh, that's why we say that the regulators need to be involved 
uh, in saying the manufacturer, telling the manufacturers, you know what, you cannot use these methods to create your product because that's impacting the environment much. So they will stop producing even products that um, impacts the environment and start producing more sustainable products. And when there is a more demand from the consumers for more sustainable products, the cost also comes low automatically. So if, if a consumer is offered two different products at the same price point, two different products that looks good and trending, obviously the consumer has to, will be choosing the sustainably developed products if they are educated upon um, the effects that it has on the environment. So it's it's definitely, it boils down to educating everybody about how it's impacting the environment. For I mean, we can talk about, I mean, I, the scholars before me in the technical session, they all said about climate impact, right? They all said there are floods or there are no rainfalls. And this year alone, even in India, we have seen many floods and we have seen droughts and they are all attributed to climate change. So if we can tie them together and educate the consumer, I think probably we definitely can. Uh, it's, it's a long way to go to answer your question, but yeah, we can make progress. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, additional one, in our survey we, have, we conducted, we have seen uh, most people, they spend, they spend much money to buy many crops because and towards be a problem for solid waste. Solid waste. So uh, in, in order that we can reduce for consuming many crops uh, in our society, we can uh, able to, uh, to manage that, that, that kind of pollution. Because we have seen many people responding, they buy many, uh, above 10 uh, crops, each person by year, they spend much money, for that then also they don't aware to donate that see crops to others or to the charity also that's a big problem the the mindset of people to buy main things even if they don't need or they don't use but also it's become problem because they are gonna throw it to the environment it's not a problem so i think that's something that i discussed in one of the slides right you have to reduce consumption but now big, big is cool these days right even with food, the Bahubali Thalis, the big food, big buffets and different kinds of clothes, 20 different shoes. Um, so that's become cool and trendy, but yes, we have to reduce consumption or at least reuse, like you said, we can give it away rather than sleeping in our closets. That's again, boils down to human behavior and consumer behaviors, educating them. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? If not, we'll end our session. Thank you guys, it's wonderful presenting to you. Thank you, ma'am. That was an enlightening and eye-opening session for us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, bye. Now we will continue with the technical session.
I cordially and respectfully welcome the chairperson, Dr. D. Udaya Banu, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental Sciences. We welcome you, ma'am. And I now invite the reporter of the session, Dr. S. Sukumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental Sciences. We welcome you, sir. Now we we'll hand over the session to the chairperson and the rapporteur. So we can continue the session. I request the participants who are going to present the paper, please come front and you can present the paper. The students from Anna University. Now I call upon the next presenter, M. Devadarshini, to present the paper on the title, Study of Anthropogenic Activities and Air Pollution, Code MP05. Good afternoon, everyone. I am K. Oliveri from Anna University, Tutukuri campus. Today, my topic about air pollution. Air, polluted, air pollution is nothing but aquas when air contains gases, dust, and odor in harmful amount. It is when concentrated gases exceed safe limits. types of air pollution there are two types of air pollution outdoor air pollution and indoor air pollution smoke acid rain greenhouse gases or outdoor air pollution tobacco smoke household products and pesticides are inhaled indoor air pollution uh, air pollution caused by natural sources and natural sources and human sources smoke that comes from oil fires volcano methane dust or natural sources Power plant and automobiles, fumes, burning, wood stove and fireplaces are human resources. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide are the pollutants uh, causes air pollution. There are two types of effects, uh, human effects and environmental effects. Human effects are is diseases such as asthma and wheezing caused by air pollution. Environmental effects are acid rain, eutrophication, haze, wildlife, ozone depression, and global climate change, etc. Impacts that are caused by air pollution, climate system, health, economy, economy, environment, ecosystem, forestry, and agriculture. Innovative ways to reduce air pollution, inks, inks from air pollution, street furniture to drive away, drive away pollution, vertical residential forest, smoke-free travels, curtains made of algae, electronic car, cloud seeding, Jane sprinklers, biosolar leaf, and PGN air patrol. Conclusion. Conclusion, air pollution has long been a serious problem in the world. Without air, earth would be an unable to sustain life. Thank you.
the paper the presentation open for discussion anybody want to ask any question you can ask if no questions we can uh, close it thank you thank you for the presentation now i call upon the next presenter sri sarandram to present the paper on the title remote sensing in coastal ecosystem monitoring code gis08 Hi, I'm Sharan from uh, Anna University VOC Engineering College, and uh, I'm just going to present uh, about remote sensing in a coastal area, coastal site, uh, I mean a seashore. Uh, just uh, I will go with the introduction or a common thing about remote sensing. Remote sensing means nothing just but mapping. The We are using satellite to uh, map the area. In coastal areas, we are uh, just a, this is just a lazy activity, which we can do physically, but uh, in some areas we can't uh, physically present there, like uh, in dense forest. Uh, if we are going inside dense forest, we don't know what ever happens there. So we are using remote sensing as a biggest tool in there like that uh, in coastal area, why we are the main objective for using remote sensing in coastal area is to avoid uh, certain things which we will be seeing in our PPT. Uh, just uh, mapping ma mapping uh, done in marine fish, fishing without affecting their habitat. Because uh, af while we are affecting their habitat, it might uh, reduce the population of fish, which will be uh, difficult for fishermen. So we are using that uh, for uh, reducing the habitat. Then, then uh, what are the things which affects the uh, fish habitat? Like uh, salinity increase. Salinity increase. Uh, salinity increases. Uh, when salinity increases, we will uh, have the difficulties in a uh, fishing habitat and uh, reduce the birds or uh, some other organism which lives there. Uh, when the climate changes, the shoreline of shoreline uh, prediction will be changed. It's just like a share market. We will predict every moves before uh, we are uh, investing in that. Like that, we will be predicting what will happen in the shore. But when some sometimes the prediction changes due to climate changes. So when it changes, the habitat of the fish around that area is also changed. Then the when like uh, urbanization, urbanization is a small topic which will affect the globe global global more. Like uh, when the seashore is affected by the climate change, the habitat will be changed. When the habitat changes, the fish which already is in that area will be reduced. The, when it reduced, it starts to evolve. When it evolves, the new species will be there. When we are getting into new species, then there will be more problem in that because when it starts to evolve, it will give us more problem in that. Marine production area. Uh, this is uh, used when many problems are occurred. This type of marine production areas are uh, built. Open water cage and pens are uh, also mainly used in these types of areas. Coral reef, coral reef advantage, advantages in inner shores. Habitat for marine species. Ha, habitat for uh, marine species is marine species. Ha, and the fisheries, tourism, and recreation and carbon storages. Many things are affected uh, due to 
many climate changes and uh, many objects changes of uh, fishing areas due to the uh, climate change and uh, some reproduction uh, time of the fishes the area will be changed in this remote sensing is used for a uh, without even a uh, if we are physically present there their habitat and uh, reproduction timing it will be very difficult for them because we will disturb them by knowing or unknowingly we will disturb it so it will be uh, sometimes government will be announcing the fishermen not to enter the sea for a certain periods for a, their reproduction time and some other calamities so it comes under that also so the area will be changed uh, satellite imaginary i i this is a just a common thing which will help us to uh, take image from satellite and uh, do a mapping or a, whatever the process we need the image the raw data we took from the satellite will be used easily by that hyperspectral image imaging is a nothing but a, a more than a 100 bands combi combination of more than 100 bands are known as hyperspectral imaging which will be helped us for a same process by a, known as a mapping application of uh, ecosystem monitoring mapping coastal wetlands and wetlands ocean uh, detecting and tracking oil spills the we we will be mostly using remote sensing not only for monitoring we will be seeing any calamities or any changes occurred by our mistakes human made mistakes and it will be used to rectify it. So, uh, thank you. The presentation open for discussion. Anyone want to ask any question, you can ask. I have one question. So you told that uh, you are mapping in the coastal region, right? Nowadays, the coastal region is not, uh, what to say, so much uh, number of things happening. Sometimes it increases in its shoreline and sometimes it goes in. So in that time, uh, how can you say that uh, prediction will work out? Um, uh, um, for that, uh, we, we are working on an app, ma'am, which will help us. We can't monitor 24 into 24 hours. We can't uh, monitor that. For that, we are working on an app. Uh, just discussed with the uh, CS students for a uh, front and uh, back end developing. So we are working on that. Uh, I mean, uh, it will just mo monitor itself. If something happens, if the seashore goes in or it comes up, they, it will predict us and uh, it will uh, just give us an uh, You not mentioned anything about that web bundles. You just, whatever the thing you have shown in the slide that you are uh, giving information, right? Yes, ma'am. You are not uh, telling about your web app or any other research thing, what you have. Because uh, it's not at, uh, I mean, just not started the dis discussion. Published, so you know, yes, you don't need to just, share. Just uh, discussed with our HOD and uh, our professors. So I can't say about that. Because still it's not started. Just discussion is going on. Mom. Okay, at least you can mention it that. Okay, ma'am. As I'm asking, you are telling. But if you want to present a paper or anything in the conference, you have to say something that something is happening and we are under process like that. You have to inform. You don't need to say everything, but you have to tell at least what is going or what type of research work you are doing, you have to mention. Okay. Okay. This is the basic thing. You should know it. That's what I want to say. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank nice you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Now I call upon the next presenter, Hamsitwani, to present the paper on the title, Study on Green Technology.
Hi everyone, and this is Hamsadwani from University VOC College of Engineering, uh, presenting the topic, what is green technology? Yes, I was just going with a question, what is green technology? It is a technology which is environmentally friendly developed and used in such a way so that it doesn't disturb our environment and conserves natural resources. It also knows as, known as environmental technology, and clean technology and we have uh, goals for green technology it is nothing but as we all know that ours three hours reduce reuse recycle we have three more with renew responsibility reuse rethink yes and we have the branches of green technology green chemistry green energy green information technology green building green nanotechnology let me move on with what is green chemistry and it was the name was coined by Paul Anthens in 1991. Green chemistry also known as sustainable chemistry since uh, the, it is an invention, design and application of chemical products and processes to reduce or to eliminate the use of hazardous substances. And for example, we can see super critical core carbon dioxide it is a non-toxic environmentally bending green solvent it is used in uh, food and pharmaceutical industries for extractions and let me move on with green energy green energy comes from uh, natural resources such as wind rain tides plants algae and geothermal test these green energy resources are renewable and green information technology also green Computing, it describes the study and the using of computer resources in an efficient way. Green IT starts with the manufacturers producing environmentally friendly products and encouraging IT departments to consider more friendly options like virtualization, power management, and proper recycling habitats. Green building, it is also a branch, a last branch of um, green technology. Green building is the practice of increasing the efficiency of building and their use of energy, water and materials and reducing building impacts on human health and environment. Though better design, construction, operation and maintenance. Let me have one more branch that is green nanotechnology. Green nanotechnology refers to the use of nanotechnology to enhance the environmental sustainability of processes producing negative externalities. It also refers to the use of products of nanotechnology to enhance sustainability. And let me say, why are companies choosing to green? Because people are requesting uh, environmental technology. Nowadays, people are moving on with green technologies. They want to be more green. For example, uh, hybrids versus non-hybrid. Most people want the hybrid for the variety of reasons. Even we all prefer hybrid fruits for their taste, color, and everything. It is more important and preferring that for the hybrid fruits are not that bad. It can be used. It is also an example of green technology. Green is a trend that is growing to be around for a while. It will stay important, stay important as long as the climate change is an issue. And let me move on with the examples of environmental friendly constructions in vehicles. We all know that Susulan Energy Limited, nothing but the windmill wherever we see in Tamil Nadu. 
ranked as the world's fifth largest winter wine supplier. It has been LEED, -E platinum rated, and is certified as an eco-friendly building by the Green Building Council, built to perfection on an area of 41,000 square meters. Biodiversity Con Conservation India Limited, Biodiversity Conservation India Private Limited is an organization that provides lifestyle solutions that focus on sustainable methods of creating zero energy homes that will not be a burden for the environment. The company's TZ Homes in Wild Whitefield, Bangalore has been certified as the first residential apartment in the world to be rated platinum under LEED. Next, Rajiv Gandhi International Airport. And it was quite interesting to know that airport we have in a green building. India's first greenfield airport is undeniably among the top 10 green building in India and the first airport in Asia to be awarded the LED silver rating certification by the US Green Building Council. And we have the benefits of green technology. As we all know, it will reduce the air pollution, offset greenhouse gases, conserves energy, reduces the need for uh, dry cell battery disposal. Conclusion, more and more corruptions, corporations and are jumping on the green bag one. It's trendy, it's important, and it is good to move on with a eco-friendly uh, behavior. It saves companies money, it's benefit for our health, and let's move on with the green. Thank you. Presentation open for the questions and discussions. Anyone want to ask anything? You can ask. Anyone to want to say anything? Shaban? Yeah. Okay, as there is no questions, I have one questions. So any example corporation level implementation for a green? For a green building, we have uh, paint using the cow dung. It is, an, uh, it is a different example we are... Nowadays, the, some of the corporations, they are maintaining the solar light. Okay. That is the best example for uh, Go Green. It is very initiative ideas. Na? Okay. Very nice presentation. All the best. I have one question, Ma. You said that it is trendy, it is important, it is good. But you are not mentioning in what way we can construct the green building and what type of technology they are using and what type of local example you can uh, say. You said about the airport and all, international airport. And all. Okay, that is good. You are giving information and why don't you give examples and why don't you give the process or what type of technology in what way we can convert into a green technology or green building? What is green building? In what way we can construct the green building? And what are all the things? What are all the factors that also you have to mention? As you are planning to present something about the green technology, you should mention that in what way we can apply the green technology into our everyday life. You said that something cow dung related paint. That is good. But you have to mention what is going or you are doing any kind of work activity or any kind of research you are doing. That also you have to include in this. Okay, good. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We extend our gratitude to each one of you gathered here and our heartfelt thanks to the delegates for taking a major part in the session. Thank you all. We have come to the end of day one. Tomorrow the session will commence at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Have a nice day. The refreshments are served outside. Please help yourselves. <laughs>